Hello everybody, a very warm welcome to our inaugural Global Nursing Conference today as we celebrate St Patrick's Day. My name is Jane Wells and I'm the Director of Nursing here at Oxley's Foundation Trust. Before I start, I'd really... Yeah, exactly. Oh, apologies, if um, everybody could go on mute who's not presenting, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, before I start, I'd like to say a really big thank you to all our organisers and all our speakers today, especially to Moses Mullimira, John Awitty and Steve Cooksley. Uh, without them, this wouldn't be happening right now. But I'd also like to take the opportunity to say a very big thank you to all our nurses and all our healthcare workers around the globe for the incredible hard work that they've given over the last year to support the pandemic. So a very heartfelt thank you from myself. This conference is very exciting and the initiative has very much been driven by our frontline nurses. And today we are launching our partnership with Kenya. We're bringing together the universities of Nairobi and Greenwich, the Mather National Teaching Hospital and Oxleys. And we're aiming to mutually advance our collaboration and exchange of knowledge and skills in innovation, research, workforce development, improvement, and strengthen our system capacity and capability across the globe together. We recently had a report from the King's Fund which identified an ABC of core nursing needs, autonomy, belonging and contribution, where we need control over our work life and to be able to act consistently with our values, to be connected to others that care with for people that we care for and that we care with, to be supported, valued and respected and to be able to make a contribution. We need to experience the effectiveness of our work and value of our outcomes. This global initiative affords us the opportunity to do this and there is no other time that is more important for us to take this forward. We have a wonderful opportunity here to nurture and grow our skills across the globe together. I'm really delighted to be able to introduce each speaker in turn throughout the day and between speakers uh, my colleague Becky will be on the chat looking at the uh, comments and questions that will be coming through and we'll put them to the speakers in turn. Please could I ask that you add your comments or your questions to the chat box and um, if there's anything especially that you would like to raise please note this and, and make sure that Becky's aware of it. But I'll move on now to our first speaker, who is our own Chief Executive, Matthew Trainer. Over to you, Matthew. So good morning and first may I welcome all of our guests uh, from our international community of nursing here at Oxleys. In the NHS, our nursing colleagues are very much the backbone of everything that we do. They provide us with our heart, with our conscience, and also with, with that spine that holds everything together. And throughout my career in the NHS, the, the things I've seen our nursing colleagues do for the people we care for, I've never been short of inspiring. And if there was ever a time to reflect on the contribution that nursing has made to all of our lives, it's been this last 12 months. So I wanted to start by saying how welcome you all are today and how welcome our national and our international colleagues are in Oxleys and in the NHS. And to start by thanking you for your contribution and for the fact that we've made today possible. So I've been asked to talk a bit about our vision for nurse leadership development and the delivery of healthcare post-COVID. So I'm going to talk through a few things about the trust and then about the role our nursing workforce play in it. So first off, a, le a little bit about Oxleys. We're a community and mental health trust in, in South East London and we've got around 4,000 staff, the, the largest group within which is, is the nursing staff we have. And our turnover is around £300 million um, pounds a year and we work in three of London's boroughs. These are Bexley, Bromley and Greenwich and we also work across Kent. We deliver a range of healthcare to people. We deliver community physical healthcare, so looking after people in their own homes through our district nursing teams and teams looking after people with things like um, respiratory difficulties, cardiac problems and diabetes. We provide health visiting, community Community specialist teams and we also have some inpatient bedded units for people who are recovering from a stay in hospital. We also provide mental health care for adults and children and we provide that both within hospital settings 
and in people's homes and through community mental health teams and increasingly these days, hugely these days through through digital access to talking therapies. And we also provide care for people with learning disabilities with a small inpatient unit, but lots of community services for people living with learning disabilities and support for them and their families. We're also a prison healthcare provider in South East London, in Wandsworth Prison and in parts of Kent. So we have around 800 staff now um, who are nurses, psychological therapists and others working in prisons to help look after the, the care of people who are in prison and forensic services as well for people who with mental health and who are involved in the criminal justice system. So we're a trust that does lots of different things, but we do it across a, a specific part of London on the whole and parts of Kent. And our staff are largely drawn from those local areas, but also, as we know, we have a really important, vibrant international workforce who contributes to our work. We're rated good by CQC, and we're also one of the only um, NHS trusts in England that's rated outstanding for the for the care it delivers in mental health inpatient wards and that's in recognition of some of the really excellent care that we provide and certainly when you go into our mental health inpatient wards the visibility of our international nursing colleagues is very high you know we couldn't run those wards without the kind of people that are joining us here on this call today and it's the same in so many of our services you know we're a national health service but we are an international workforce caring for local people in London. In terms of our trust, our, our strategy, and you can see it on all my slides in the, in the top corner there, is improving lives. And we try to improve lives by offering the best possible care we can to our patients and their families. And, and that's our, our purpose, whether it's, it's care delivered in your home, whether it's care delivered in an inpatient setting, whether it's delivered online or whether it's delivered in a prison setting. What we try to do is make those, make those people that we come into contact with to improve their lives by offering the best possible care. And we recently changed our values because we had some of those kind of organisational values you often see in, in the NHS where we talk about partnership working and we talk about, you know, financial prudence and getting value for money. These are all important things, but actually they didn't speak to the way that our staff think about themselves and their role and why they come to work. So our values now as an organisation are that we're kind, we're fair, that we listen and that we care. And these are things that I think go to the heart actually of nursing and go to the heart of what people in Oxley's want to see the organisation behave like. And in terms of the challenges we're facing, we're caring for people in a growing and diverse population. You know, in some of our boroughs, we're expecting the population to grow by close to 10 percent over the next five years or so. Really big growth in demand, increasing diversity, more older people with the challenges that brings in terms of providing them with lifelong care and particularly that important care in the last years of our lives. And also with some pockets of severe deprivation. And although London as a city has a lot of wealth within it, it also has some really extreme poverty. And lots of the people we care for have grown up in poverty and have suffered from those impacts of poverty. And our staff are there to try to help them with all of these other economic and social impacts that affect people's lives, their mental and physical health. And we really recognise that that deprivation and that unfairness within some of London boroughs is a really big factor in what we're trying to do as a health service to, 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 con to, to come into to contact with that and try to do something about it. And thinking about the next few years as a trust, we've identified a couple of priorities that we think are really important in trying to guide the trust through the next couple of years. One is to really focus on great out of hospital care. And, you know, the NHS has had a big focus on hospitals, on what happens in hospitals and what happens in wards. But we recognise we need to invest more and strengthen our community teams in physical and in mental health to provide more care closer to where people live and to try to help people recover and live stronger, independent lives themselves. And that includes by supporting their families to care for them. We also want to tackle delays. Now, this is the difference between waiting for something that you need and a delay in waiting for that. So when you go to catch a train, you know, if I go to the train station now and it's half past nine and I know my train is due in 15 minutes, I don't mind waiting for the train to arrive on time at 9.45. But if the train is delayed and doesn't arrive until 10 or 10.15, it's the delay that is frustrating. And we see this too much in healthcare, where you're told you need an intervention in two weeks, but we can't deliver that to you for six or seven weeks because the waiting list has got out of control and we have delays in place. And those delays cause anxiety, 
they cause tension and fear when you're waiting for that diagnosis, that service. So we want to really tackle those delays and become intolerant of those delays and understand what's driving them and tackle them. And this, really importantly, we want to make Oxley's a great place to work. And in the last 12 months, we've had a lot of conversations with our black staff, with staff from a range of ethnic minorities about their experiences in Oxley's and in the NHS. And really that sense of the unfairness that people have lived with for decades and that injustice they've lived with both in society and within the NHS has come to the fore. And in making Oxley's a great place to work, we need to understand the experiences of our colleagues from all kinds of ethnic backgrounds within Oxley's and work to make sure that they feel they have fair opportunities and that they're treated and supported in a way that offers them equity within the workplace. So we're really focusing as part of making Oxley's a great place to work on building a fair Oxley's, looking at how we go about the process of recruitment, how we create opportunity within work and how we support people with learning and development. Now, the last 12 months has really thrown some of these plans um, off course a bit because we've had to rethink everything about the way we provide healthcare. And it's roughly a year ago to the day, I think, that um, we were starting to get very, very scared about what was likely to happen in London and in England about um, with COVID-19. And it's affected all of us in the last 12 months in so many different ways. We've experienced it very differently as individuals, but we've all experienced some of that anxiety, that fear, that fear of what it means for us and for those that we love, and also that sense of loss, whether that's loss of a loved one or whether it's loss of things that really matter to us in our lives. We've all been through this in the last 12 months. There's been the impact of lockdown and loneliness, of the challenge of staying at home for months, and some of our staff I know have now been self-isolating for a year now because of their, their health conditions, and you know we've seen this happen to our parents, to our families as well. And there's been others of us who've had to go into work right throughout that. And I know some of the nurses on this call will have been travelling into work on otherwise empty roads on days when the rest of the country was in lockdown to put on your PPE, to wash your hands, to make sure you're getting tested and that you're not taking infection home to your families. And the, the sort of fear and the tension that that's created and sometimes going into services where you've been very short staffed dealing with very sick patients in this. And that's all created a really difficult context for all of us through the pandemic. And this has had a big impact on us and on the people that we care for. And what we've been seeing as a trust is that this is leading to demand for our mental health services increasing. And um, we've seen increases in things like domestic abuse, greater risk to vulnerable people at home. And then we've got the economic impacts of losing the jobs and people worried about what's going to happen with their mortgages, you know, what the life's going to look like in the next year. And we've also seen in physical health really big increases in demand for our diabetes services and the demands on our district nursing services and others. And for children, they've lost a year. They've lost a year of that development, of that contact with their classmates, of being around their friends. And some of us have had to homeschool as well. And, you know, my two children, my two daughters went back to school last week after basically spending the best part of a year hanging around with people in their 40s, which is not what children want, you know. And we know that our society is not equal. And in this pandemic, the most vulnerable have suffered the most. And I'm in a position where, if I'm honest, my children won't suffer that greatly because we'll be able to support them to catch up. But that won't be the case for everyone. And the unequal impact of the pandemic, it's killed more people from deprived backgrounds. It will continue to damage the lives of people from deprived backgrounds. And we as a trust need to think about how we cope with that for our staff and how we cope with that for the people that we care for. A few personal reflections for me. Um, around a year ago, I got a phone call and I was asked to take a step out of Oxley's for eight weeks or so um, to go and become Deputy Chief Executive of the NHS Nightingale Hospital in East London. And I left the trust in the very capable hands of Dr. Ifia Kutcher, um, who is our Deputy Chief Executive and a, a very r rightly well-respected psychiatrist and a fantastic man who led the trust in my absence. And I took this step out to go to the Nightingale. And this was at a point where, and, and I think it's sometimes useful for us to remember what it felt like a year ago, and where we were seeing videos coming from other parts of the world that were showing people lying on the floors of cor corridors and hospitals in Italy and, and then elsewhere, where they weren't able to get access to the oxygen they needed and where people were dying and suffering because of that access, that lack of access to care. And the Nightingale concept came about because we thought in London we might need you know, literally thousands more intensive care beds. London a year ago had 800 intensive care beds. It now has 1,500 open. But we thought we might need three or 4,000. And that if we didn't create capacity to ventilate people, they would die for want of access to ventilation. Um, so around a year ago now, I was asked no, to 
which is a country centre in East London. And this was the site that greeted us. It was this empty conference hall um, and there was workers in there starting to put down flooring. And in the course of the next um, nine days or so, working with the British Army, um, including the Gurkhas and others, and working with colleagues from across nursing, from across the private sector and the building sector, we put together a hospital which initially was ready to take 120 patients a week later. And what you can see there, that was me uh, with my uh, homemade haircut um, standing in the middle of the first ward that we were prepared to open. And um, we opened um, this capacity within a couple of weeks to help London try to care for people who we thought would otherwise have died without access to life saving care. And as it turned out, and you'll have seen some of this in the news, you know, the Nightingale wasn't needed quite in the way that we'd feared. Um, and I think we always viewed it as an insurance policy. You know, we always pay out, we all pay out for car insurance, home insurance, fire insurance. You know, it's a policy you never want to have to cash in. And I think with the Nightingale, we were glad it was there, but we were also glad it never had to be used on the scale that was envisaged because for the Nightingale to be necessary, terrible things would have been having, happening in, in hospitals elsewhere across the country. And and so in a way, it's a relief it was never, never necessary. But I think for me, you know, it was that sense that things were happening in Oxley's. I had to move away from home for eight weeks and be away from my wife and children because of the risks of moving back and forward between an ICU, but also the demands of the job. But it was also seeing the NHS pulled together in the face of the pressures in the country. And although there was a lot of media interest in the Nightingale, actually really where the hard work was happening was happening in the lives of our nursing colleagues who were in inpatient wards for physical and mental health. It was happening for our district nurses who were walking into the homes of people um, who were sick and unwell and where COVID was this, still this unknown and terrifying disease. It was our nurses who were supporting people to, to go through end of life at home and our health visitors who were looking after vulnerable children and all those specialist teams that make up Oxley's and that make up the NHS. And although we've seen a lot about intensive care on the news, actually some of the real richness of what the NHS has done in this pandemic has been the great courage and the great kindness of our nursing staff as they've taken it upon themselves and they've taken on this fear and taken on that anxiety and they've gone out and done their job and they've delivered care and they've delivered compassionate care and they've gone over and above day in, day out and at risk to themselves and to those that they care about to care for others. And that for me is one of the things that's really the heart of nursing. It's not just the, the good humour and the dedication and keeping the NHS on its feet and being that backbone of the organisation. It's also that selfless sense of care and compassion. And that for me is the real beauty that I see in our in our global, in our international workforce when I go into our workplaces across all places and talk to our fantastic nursing home. And I think this was a, a photo I took at the Nightingale just on um, one of the days there where we held a, a minute's silence to think about all the colleagues that we'd lost. And in everything that we think about over the last 12 months, it's moments like those that will never leave us for the rest of our lives. And it's moments thinking and reflecting on that huge contribution that we've all made and that you've all made to people's lives over the last 12 months. And that's why thinking about our staff wellbeing is so important, because we need, as we recognise the importance of what you've all done, we need to invest and support you to take the NHS through this period and into the future where you continue to improve lives and make that huge difference to the lives of people that we care for. And I think in amongst some of the dark moments of the last year, we've also learned to listen to each other more and to learn and to find hope in some of these experiences we've been through. You know, COVID's taught us a great deal about ourselves and also about the people we work with or care for. And what we've seen is the clarity of purpose that we've all had over the last year and that sense of really pulling together and bringing ourselves together to save lives. It's offered us in some ways the chance to push out the way some of the barriers that we faced in bringing care together and working more closely with our social care partners and bringing teams together around the needs of the patient. But it's also really brought home that the well-being of our staff is for a trust, you know, for the organisation that an NHS trust is. It's our most important task in this sense actually the best thing we can do to look after the people that we care for is to look after those people who deliver our care and within Oxley's we've done things ranging from we've given staff gift vouchers and um, we've sent um, goodie boxes to people's homes I mean I've still got mine kicking around here somewhere full of, full of papers and you know it's things like tea bags and hand cream and, and some, a small box of chocolates 
that sense of value. We're investing money in improving our break rooms and we're looking at things we can do to support people with parking and transport and so on. You know, it's recognising all these things that actually people want to take pride in their job and to do that, they need to feel valued by their employer. And that is a really big task for us. We also need to recognise that we're confronting decades of inequality and discrimination against against people from ethnic minorities, against people with different life experiences. Um, and that for many of our, our black staff and many of our other ethnic minority staff, they've had to put up with, with years of unfair treatment, um, whether it's the experience of going to work and what happens at, you know, while you're on your commute or what happens when you get there. We've had to recognise, I think, in the last 12 months, some of that pain and some of those voices that we've just not been listening to. And we've created a space to listen to those voices. And we're now really trying to make change that I think moves beyond this pandemic because the pandemic with this, is a healthcare emergency. I think what's happened over the last 12 months in our conversations about treating people fairly and with dignity and with respect, I think that needs to be much bigger than the impact of this pandemic. It needs to recognise a fundamental change to the way that we in England think about our international colleagues and welcome you into our hearts and into our lives in the way that you've you've put yourselves forward to care for us. We also need to recognise the way that we've worked with our system partners to deliver better care and access for the most vulnerable through this. And also the kind of conversation we're having now, we have to think about things like agile and remote working. Some of the, the, the positives have been great, the connections we can make across the country and within teams, and these have been fantastic. Some of it is it's become quite isolating. And, you know, we're spending a lot of time at home or quite isolated in pockets away from the people that we draw strength from. I certainly get my energy and strength from being around others and hearing them talk about their work and what's going on in their day. And, you know, I'm, I'm craving getting back to that and thank God for the vaccinations and those protections that are going to allow us to get back into that. But really in all of this and thinking about our leadership challenge and all of you are leaders in your own way in the services you, you work in and run. We have to think about compassionate leadership and the heart of leadership there. And that compassionate leadership is key. And the more that we can spend time back around those people that we draw strength from, that compassion has to come to the fore. So Jane mentioned at the start there some of what's happening with nursing. And we know in the UK um, that around two years ago, we identified we were going to be short of more than 100,000 nurses in the UK within the next 10 years. And that every year we need 5,000 new nurses coming into training. And then we need those nurses to want to stay in the workforce. Plus, we need 5,000 international nurses joining the NHS every year for three years. And that's why we're delighted to be able to talk to our colleagues from across Kenya, you know, at the University of Nairobi and other places about the opportunity there is within Oxley's and within the NHS. What we have seen through the pandemic is that applications for nurse training have really increased. People have recognised the fantastic value that nurses bring, that the, the difference they make to lives. And I think they're starting to get some of that recognition they've always deserved. And those applications have increased. But we also need to keep people in the NHS. We need to make it a better place to work and to build a career. You know, and, and for that, a really important part is for people to feel that they've been treated fairly and have fair opportunity within the workforce. We need to support people to, to have a better work life balance and, and to make sure that, you know, people are able to see their families and spend time with their families and not have to work all the hours that God sends to make sure that they can they can look after their loved ones. And I think there is a debate going on nationally at the minute about how much we pay our staff. And, you know, we need people to earn a salary that pays the bills and keeps food on the table. And that's particularly difficult in London and with the cost of living in London. And, you know, I hope that in the, the discussions over the, the pay increase, that the, the impact of those that salary on our nursing workforce is recognised. And I hope that some some sense comes into the discussions about the recognition that some of our staff need. We don't all need it in the NHS. Someone um, of my grade, you know, I don't I don't need um, you know, to be a factor in these pay discussions, but certainly our, our, our band fives, our band sixes, our, our healthcare assistants and others, you know, people people need to have their effort recognised. And I hope that some of this plays through in the pay discussions that we're seeing happening nationally, because people need to pay the bills and they need to keep food on the table. And that's an important part of encouraging people to stay in the workforce. But ultimately, what we need to do most of all, reflecting in the last year, is to treat each other with kindness and with dignity and with respect. And to recognise that the last 12 months has brought up so much for us all to think about. And some of it has been hurtful and some of it is painful to think about. But lots of it also offer us, offers hope. It offers us the hope that we learn to listen to each other better and to recognise us all, each other, as human beings who need to be treated with dignity and respect. 
And as we open our arms to our international colleagues and encourage them to join us and recognise the fantastic efforts of our international colleagues who are already within the workforce and the brilliant contribution um, that we get from across London and from across England and across across the world into Oxley's, to recognise that we need to treat to each other in the way that we say as a trust that is aligns with our values, that we're kind, that we're fair, that we listen and that we care. And, you know, I'll create some time for questions now, but I just wanted to say on behalf of Oxley's and to all of you in our national workforce, thank you. And I'm delighted to be here today opening this conversation as part of our commitment to our nursing workforce and this first Oxley's Global Conference, I'm sure, and I hope will be the start of something fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. That was a lovely presentation. We're very grateful. I'm going to ask Becky if she has anything on the chat that she'd like to raise. Hi everyone, so at the moment there's nothing that's coming in the chat, just people saying that they're following, they're looking forward to kind of being here and seeing where this goes. I think just because it's early doors, not, not many people are, are commenting yet, they're just listening at the moment. But it looks like people are going to engage, so that's good. Thank you very much, Becky. I've got one question for you, Matthew, if I may, and it's on behalf of myself and John and Moses and our colleagues. And uh, we've been reflecting on how, as an executive team and a board, we can support the global initiative going forward. And I, I'd be really grateful of any reflections that you might have on that as an organisation. This isn't new. There are, there are many people in Oxley's who've been doing this work, such as Francis, who we'll hear from later for, for many years. But I'd just like to see how can we raise the profile of this? How can we keep the inertia going and how can we really make this successful and uh, take it forward together? Mm. I think that's a very good point, Jane, and I think it's it's the role of the, the board within the trust and the executive to, to champion this kind of work. You know, we as an organisation and as the NHS, you know, if, if, if we get quite sort of cold and unemotional in the first place, all right, which isn't my style, as I hope you, you you picked up. But you know, if we think about it, we have a workforce need. We have vacancies and we have roles we need to fill, and we have skills we need to draw into the NHS. Now, lots of our services already run, as I said, on this backbone of international nursing as well. You know, we rely on colleagues, and you know, when I go into Oxley's house and I speak to colleagues from Ghana and Nigeria and other parts of the world and and the Caribbean and. and and people tell me about their experiences and how they came to work in the NHS and what's happened with their families and the development over the years. There's already a tremendous strength of global nursing within Oxley's. But I think we haven't recognised that openly enough. We haven't necessarily listened also enough to the experiences of our colleagues internationally for working for us. And we need to bring those voices to the fore. But we also then need to match up that requirement we have to enhance our workforce through recruitment and, and determine what those career paths are and join up those career paths with the strengths of the workforces that are elsewhere in the world. And I think the kind of work that I know Francis and colleagues do, it's about making those connections with institutions in other countries who can help us with the workforce, identifying the barriers and the challenges we'll find to encourage people to come here and to work with us, but to try to offer people a roadmap through those barriers and create those connections that will make it possible. Because I know there's been, the NHS tries to recruit globally quite regularly. Sometimes we identify opportunities, we identify a pool of people, but the follow through from that pool of people to the number of people you get into a job can often be quite low. And it can take a huge amount of work to get people through to the end posts. And we need to understand what those barriers are and we need to be more, more proactive and aggressive in tackling those barriers and supporting people to get here. So we as an executive and a board, we need to recognise the value that international nursing colleagues bring to our workforce. We need to champion that value, identify the need and smooth people's passage in terms of coming into the NHS. And then once they get here, they want to stay. They want to have to stay here and work for us. And, that, and that, then it's incumbent on us to be a good employer that listens and invests in their career development. Thank you. Uh, it would be really good to reciprocate and share learning uh, across the whole of the morning so that we can see how that we can best utilise that. Thank you very much, Matthew, for a wonderful presentation. I can see that Lord Crisp has joined us. Very warm welcome, Lord Crisp, and thank you so much for joining us at our inaugural conference today. Um, it's fantastic timing because uh, we can now hand over to you uh, to do your presentation and tell us about Nursing Now and the Nightingale Challenge. And by means of introduction to conference participants, uh, Lord Nigel Crisp is the co-chair for Nursing Now and also the UK All-Parliamentary Group for Global Health.
So very welcome. Thank you, Lord Crisp. I'll hand over to you now. Uh, right. Well, look, tr tremendous pleasure to join you. Congratulations on this conference. I only know a little bit about it, but it seems terrific that you've brought your nurses together uh, and partners around the trust and, uh, and, and around the world to, to discuss the really important issues about, um, uh, about the future with nurses. Um, so congratulations on that. Let me also just kick off by uh, congratulating, or, or actually rather not congratulations, pay, pay my tribute to nurses globally for what's been happening over the last year and more and what is continuing to happen. Now, I have lots of friends who are working clinically in the UK and elsewhere, and I just know how tired people are getting by this stage of it all, apart from anything else. And, and what a worrying and difficult year this has been. So let me, as a as a potential patient, but happily not one, um, pay my tribute um, to everyone who's been doing so much over this uh, uh, over this last year, with more to come, I'm afraid to say. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about is the Nursing Now campaign, but I'm also going to talk about why nurses are going to become ever more important in the future. Uh, and there's some very clear reasons for why that is the case. Nurses are important now, but I think you're going to have a bigger role even in the future. And then I'll finally touch on partnerships. And I believe I've got 15 minutes. Is that right? OK, so I've got about 12. Right. Let me start off by talking about Nursing Now. Nursing Now is a three-year campaign, global campaign, to improve health by raising the profile and status of nurses. Its origins are that it's about health as well as being a nursing campaign, but the focus is health. Um, and it's really there because I and colleagues in, in, in Parliament in the UK realise that there is uh, that nurses are too often undervalued, unable to achieve their true potential, work to the top of their licence, as the Americans would call it. So uh, that's uh, why we set up this campaign. And my goodness, it took off. We didn't realise quite how well it was going to take off. Here you can see the launch of Nursing Now in Malaysia. You can see it in Qatar. No, this is Jordan down the bottom left. Um, I'm not quite sure where the other two are, um, but you can probably read them yourselves. Um, but, you know, we've had a most extraordinary response to the campaign. And actually, starting in February 2018, by December 2020, we had 700 plus regional, national, local Nursing Now groups in 126 countries. And I can tell you that the last three countries to join us were in November, China, in December, Russia, uh, and then finally in January, after the campaign had really more or less been over, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, so filling in spaces on, on, on the map. And these groups in some countries have been extraordinarily busy and engaged and have really achieved some, some, some massive uh, increases in, in investment in nursing. And I take places like Pakistan, Uganda and Mexico in those sort of categories. Um, we've deliberately not made a UK a focus because this is a global campaign, even though it started in the UK. And we didn't want it to look like a British thing, even though it was our idea uh, uh, and, and we kicked it off. Actually, the first people to get involved um, were African countries um, and indeed Uganda. Uh, were part of our, our, our part of our launch party. Well, a number of things happened. One is that we managed to persuade the World Health Organization to make last year the year of the nurse and the midwife. Um, and what we're thinking about now is how do we leverage leverage the momentum of 2020 and nursing now to create a lasting legacy from the international year of the nurse and the midwife, but actually also all these 700 groups uh, uh, around the world. Well, one of the things that happened, again, which we asked WHO to do and they agreed to do, was to create the first ever State of the World's Nursing Report. This is the first time that anyone has pulled together all the uh, detail of what's happening with nursing in every country in the world. And it's a fantastic document. You can find it on the World Health Organization uh, site. You can see at the bottom that it's actually... Um, published by the World Health Organization with the ICN, that's what that symbol is in the middle, and Nursing Now. Um, and our partners throughout this campaign have been WHO, a great partner for us, World Health Organization, uh, and the International Council of Nurses. Now, what's important about this is it produces the data, it allows countries to look at what's happening in other countries, it sort of shows how de nursing is developing. But it's going to be followed up at the World Health Assembly this year in May with a new publication of Strategic Directions for Nursing. So Strategic Directions for Nursing will be published in 2021. And this is essentially a new strategy uh, for nursing globally, um, which will be 
uh, adopted and discussed at the World Health Assembly, we assume it'll be adopted in May, and there'll be follow-up activity globally. So a lot happening globally around nursing, which is a backdrop for what you are doing uh, in, in Oxley's. Um, and actually, as well, the WHO have uh, named this year the International Year of Health and Care Workers. They're really going to announce that in April, actually. But their slogan, I think, is great. Protect, invest together. And it's a real focus and recognition that actually we need to protect our health workers. We need to invest in them um, and we need to do that together, together across disciplines, but together across countries as well. So that will be coming out in uh, uh, there'll be a publication around that, um, I think, probably on April the 12th, which is uh, World Health Day uh, around 2021. Uh, and and this this great slogan and I think what will also happen then as a matter of interest is that there will be a publication of a draft uh, neither then or in May care compact and this is something which is a compact which were which the WHO is asking countries to sign up to about what they owe their health workers in terms of protection respect support we have in this country the UK the uh, the military covenant the armed forces covenant which is about what we owe the armed forces in the UK. Well, this idea of a care compact feels to me to be a very positive one. It's one I will be certainly pushing uh, here in the UK. Now, the other thing we set up as part of nursing now is we set up the Nightingale Challenge. And this was a challenge in 2020 to, nurse, to employers of nurses globally to provide development support for young nurses and midwives. Um, and we asked them all to identify 20 and uh, and provide development opportunities in leadership, in understanding systems, in advocacy, not in clinical work, which will be coming their, their way anyway, but in order to be agents of change and, uh, and leaders for the future. Um, and we were delighted that 31,000 plus young nurses and midwives have been signed up to it by their employers in 2020. So delighted that the Burdett Trust for Nursing, even though Nursing Now finishes in May, the Burdett Trust for Nursing is going to continue that programme to 2022 and beyond. Now, can you imagine how powerful that is? Because these 20, 31,000 young nurses and midwives are networked together. So you can see an entire uh, network of um, young people, um, young nurses and midwives really make, making change happen. And let's say we get another 20,000 involved. And let's say Oxley's becomes involved, because I don't know if you are, um, for, for the future. Uh, get involved in what we'll now, we're now renaming the Nursing Now Challenge. So those are all the stories about Nursing Now and, and some of the legacy and, and some of the things that will be happening as we go forward. But let me turn to the other point I want to address, which is nursing will become even more important in the future. And that's because the world is changing, because epidemiology is changing. There are more non-communicable diseases and long-term conditions, and those are areas where nurses in the UK, but also elsewhere, are already taking the lead. And as that burden of disease increases, nurses will play a bigger role, be a bigger role in leadership and so on. But I also think the world is changing and people are not seeing health just in physical terms anymore. And you as nurses, of course, are educated into taking a biological, psychological, social perspective on health. And I think that's going to be the sort of way we start to think about health much more in the future. There's also much more focus on value, value-based healthcare, and on quality. And again, this, these are areas where, as you all know, nurses are, 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 have an extraordinarily valuable role to play. But a fourth area is that actually we wouldn't be having this conversation quite like this 30 years ago. There is now a track record of nurse practitioners, nurse specialists, some of the people in this event who have worked for 20 or 30 years pushing the boundaries. There's evidence, there's a track record, and building on your track record, standing on your shoulders, as it were, um, I think the nursing profession can move on. Fifth point here is the changing status of, of women. We've got, as I say, 126 countries around the world involved in nursing now, and my observation, my very simple observation, is that um, uh, how nurses are treated in country links quite closely with how women are treated. Now, nursing is not a gendered profession. There are plenty of men in nursing, but the majority of nurses are, are women. Uh, and actually, we see uh, as women, uh, status of women in countries increase, we should be seeing as well the status of nurses in, co in countries increasing. And then finally, COVID. And COVID, hasn't it shown 
what a big role nurses have in everything from working with the public in their own homes and the community to giving us our jabs to uh, uh, to intensive care uh, and everything in between and, and roundabout. And I think there's been enormous uh, increased respect for nurses, for all health workers, but nurses in particular during the course of this last year. So there's a changing world there, a big picture of what is happening externally. And how I think this will translate in the future is that we'll see many more of the things we see a few of now, nurse-led clinics, specialist nurses and nurse practitioners in all kinds of areas, primary and community services. I think in a lot, a number of countries in 15, 20 years, we'll see primary care being essentially nurse-based uh, with doctors involved in different ways. I think we'll see a big shift there. And then of course, there's the whole area of public health and health creation dealing with the causes of health as well as the causes of discussions about, but something I haven't got time to talk about. So I think we'll see those sort of things translate through into real changes in the way services are delivered with nurses playing an even bigger role in the future. And what does all that mean for global health or how does that link with global health? Well, let's look at the global health picture. Um, and I think that there are three enormous things that are around in the global health picture. And those of you who are working across um, uh, from Oxleys into your partner organizations in other countries or, or you as individuals are linking with people in other countries, um, I think there are three big th themes here around global health. There are some others about governance and how you strengthen the World Health Organization so to deal better with pandemics. But I think at the core of it, in countries, it's about strengthening health systems in countries so they can tackle infectious disease, so they can tackle NCDs, and so they can tackle the consequences of climate change. And those things need to be tackled together because actually they link together uh, very dramatically. I think we'll also see a much bigger emphasis on prevention, protection and health creation. A recognition that, you know, rather than just treating people with diabetes, why don't we try and stop a few people getting it? Why don't we, uh, you, know, you know, why don't we tackle things up front and earlier? Um, and I think and I hope that we'll also have this big theme that I've already mentioned, that when we think about our health and care workers, we have a new compact for the future, which is about protecting, investing and doing so together. And on that word together, let me have one very brief word about partnerships. Um, I spent a lot of time over the last few years working with partnerships between people in the UK and people mainly in Africa, but also in many in African countries, but also in Southeast Asia and various other parts of the world. And I know how valuable that can be for both parts, how much we learn from each other. We can support from our relatively rich position in the UK, we can support development elsewhere, but we can also learn a great deal from people who without our resources, but are just as smart as we are, and who've learned to innovate and do things differently, partly because they don't have resources. There's a great expression which I'm going to finish with, which is everyone's got something to learn and everyone's got something to teach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lord Crisp. That was a really, really great presentation and has really given us food for thought about how we can take things forward for the future. I'm going to go back to Becky now and see what Becky's got in the chat and the questions for us. Hello. Yes, so we have had a couple of things come in. One of the first questions that come in was, so what opportunities are there for training for our international partners in the UK and Oxleys? So I didn't know who wanted to answer that. And then we've got a specific question from Matthew as well, once that one's been answered. Uh, well, the specific opportunities, I think I ought to pass it to Matthew, who I think is your chief executive, <laughs> um, because it's up to you, you know. Um, the, 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 uh, there are some national schemes. Health Education England has been running some schemes and so have, um, uh, and globally there is the medical, uh, international medical schemes and so on. But bluntly, it's about you and your organizations at a local level building whatever relationship it is you want to have with another country or another institution. And that's the most powerful bit, you know? Mm -hmm. I think these partnerships are fantastic because they're people to people. They're people like Matthew working with his 
chief executive counterpart in Kampala or or, 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 or wherever. Um, but there are also people like any of you, um, and I see my good friend Moses Mulimira here, um, working with uh, you know colleagues in other areas and learning from each other um, in a way that joins up the world um, in in really vital ways. Um, so the boundaries are what you make them. I mean, there are some official schemes, but they can be quite difficult. And one of the big issues is funding, uh, mm. as, as you will rec well recognize. Um, so a bit of a general reply, Becky. I, I don't know if Matthew wants to comment. <laughs> thank you, Sir Nigel. And thank, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation there as well. Very much appreciated. And um, so, I mean, I, I might ask Jane to talk a bit about the technical elements of some of the partnership we've been discussing. But as, as I said earlier, I think it's about us identifying the opportunity and then creating the relationships that allow us to bring in through our partners overseas, the right kind of people with the right kind of training and skill sets to seize those opportunities within Oxley's. You know, we already have a strong, dynamic uh, international workforce within the trust, mm -hmm. but we do need to spend more time listening to them, listening to them about the process of, of how they found it getting to Oxley's, about their experience of recruitment. And we know we need as a trust and as a service to do more around recruitment, recruitment to recognize the barriers, often the unconscious barriers that we put in place of bringing in the best people and giving them access to the fairest opportunities as well. And also, as, as Sir Nigel says, you know, there has to be some money behind this because this training isn't a cost free thing. It's about investing in your people. And we need to get the NHS into a place where we're much more proactive about investing in the future of our workforce. And we've heard a lot about this recently, you know, but the money you spend now on building through and training and developing people, it pays back year in, year out for years to come. So, Jane, is there anything you wanted to say about the specifics of the programme we're developing here before I take the next question from Becky? No, I think you've covered most of it. I think it's it's very much about us identifying the opportunities and taking a step back and thinking about what we could do really creatively together so that we yeah. can share that learning and be more organised about how we do this so that it becomes part of the everyday business for us and part of our mm. culture of how we do things. I know that mm. Moses has got experience of this in some previous organisations he's worked in and I just wonder if I could put him on the spot for uh, 30 seconds to ask him if he's got any examples where he thinks this has worked successfully. Um, thank you, Jen. I think we've got, we've had some successful examples in Uganda, I think Kenya, which we're looking at as a trust in terms of building up. Also other countries like Sierra Leone, Zambia, and globally, um, we're looking at um, India. My colleague Fla, who's coming in from HEE, will share a bit more where HEE is looking visually. But we've been working closely with Fed in over so many other countries. Thank you, Moses. Uh, Becky, do you want to uh, pass the next question over to Matthew, please? Yes. So watching on our live stream, we currently have the National Healthcare Conference. Um, they have asked Matthew, Addy, who was co-chair of the NHS England and NHS Improvement BAME staff network, resigned recently, citing very important points. What does Matthew think of support at the BAME staff at this level? Yeah, I mean, Addy is... Ad, as, as played a really important role in raising the profile of BAME staff within NHS England and, and some of the issues that we've talked about today on his board. I think he's been very clear that there are still some really significant structural barriers in the NHS to supporting our colleagues um, from, from other ethnic minorities to really come to prominence in the way that we want them to. We're still in a position where I think um, we only have, I think we have fewer than 10 directors of nursing from a BAME background in England. And when you think about the huge number of BAME staff we have in the nursing workforce, there is a lack of representation at senior levels. And we know from talking to our colleagues that they want to see people like them succeeding and thriving in senior roles. You know, at Oxley's as a trust, we have, I think, um, in the last um, set of data from NHS England, I think we're in the top three trusts in the country for BAME representation in our board. And we've worked very hard uh, to, to do this. And, you know, you do this in a number of ways. You do it by recognising people's excellence and their contributions. But you also do it by taking the time to think about how people make contributions in a different way and not to always recruit like for like. You know, too many chief executives in the NHS look like me. You know, um, I think when I started at Oxley's, three of the NHS chief execs in South London were white men called Matthew. 
And, you know, you think this is not diversity, this is not encouraging for people. Um, and when you look at the, the workforce in London, when all they look up is uh, they see grey haired white men um, running the show, uh, it, it doesn't encourage people to come to the fore. And I think that's why as a trust, we have fantastic leaders, people like Christine. We have our deputy chief exec, uh, Dr. Ifia Kocha. We have people in really senior, really important decision making authority holding roles within the trust who represent the diversity of our staff. But what we need to crack is, once you get to band seven, there is a ceiling there that is very hard and very difficult for some of our, our ethnic minority staff to break through. And we're doing a lot of work to understand why those barriers are there. Some of it is that people's aspirations are dampened because they've seen the way the organization works and the service works. Others is the way that we recruit too often. We recruit like for like, and we recruit for comfort, and we recruit for people who are like ourselves. And that closes our eyes and closes our ears to the wonderful strength that diversity can bring to our workforce. And I think some of the points that Ade has made at NHS England is that we not we need to not just say the right things here, we need to do the right things and demonstrably do the right things and we seem to be doing them over time because people have experienced dec decades of inequity in the way the NHS has supported people into more senior roles. And it'll take us more than 12 months of saying the right things and saying the right things on social media. We need to be seen to do the right things and that needs to be seen in the people who lead our workforce and who lead our organisation. Thank you very much, Matthew. I'd like to extend our thanks to Lord Crisp as we move on to our next speaker, who is Dr Fleur Kitzel, International Global Health Lead for Health Education England. You're very kind. So can you see a title slide that says Oxley's Global Nurses Conference? Yes, we can. That's perfect. That's the one I was hoping. OK, so thank you for inviting me. So Moses, um, as he mentioned earlier, invited me to talk about um, a little bit of the work that we're doing in Health Education England. So thanks also to um, Nigel Chris for a bit of a, an, an introduction there. Um, so uh, my role is on one aspect of some work that we're doing in um, what's called the Global Engagement Team of um, Health Education England. But I've got a couple of slides at the beginning just to remind us or, or help us remember what um, Health Education England does. So um, Health Education England is the strategic workforce body of the NHS and essentially it does three things. Its, its purpose is to ensure the future healthcare workness, workforce has the right numbers, right skills, to deliver the care that we need, um, supporting the development of the current workforce to be able to use uh, and, and you know um, update skills, and to um, ensure the quality of the learning environments for learners. So Health Education England does a huge amount of work in terms of the practice-based learning that goes on for nurses, doctors, therapists, pharmacists and the like. Um, so that's um, basically our general role in terms of Health Education England. We have some national teams and we also have seven regional offices. Um, and Oxley's, as far as I understand, I think you come under the South East Regional Office uh, as part of the um, Oxfordshire, Thames Valley uh, area. I think I'm correct in that. Um, the global engagement side of health education is a national team. We call it a directorate um, and it does three things. Um, you'll notice a pattern beginning to appear here. Um, so we have three teams. One is a, a team called Technical Collaboration and Knowledge Exchange, and that works with governments. Um, a government may approach the UK government um, with a, um, a request for working with uh, the NHS. As we all know, the NHS has a wonderful brand, particularly um, overseas as well as in the UK. And they might ask for some help in uh, workforce planning. They might ask for some, uh, ha have some questions about how can they improve cancer care services in their country. And then we can be a sort of a connector as well as a, a convener of um, workshops to help support that. We also um, offer educational placements in the NHS for overseas uh, workforce. 
That isn't typically for nurses. Um, that is typically for other groups. We do a lot of that for doctors through a scheme called the MTI scheme, which you're probably familiar with as a trust. Um, so we don't do a lot of that for nurses once they're qualified, unless we recruit them to work in, in the UK, as you know. And a third stream of our work is to offer overseas placements for NHS staff. And that's three broad things. And the purpose, the, the circular figure is the purpose of, of that is to sort of create a virtual circles. They may not be um, complete uh, virtual circle in the same place, but the idea building on uh, what Nigel was saying that of um, globalizing the workforce so that people come to the UK, people from the UK go and through all of that, everybody has something to learn. Everybody has something to give. Um, and and we, we make a contribution, all of us, to the uh, globalization of the workforce. So now I want to tell you about one particular programme that we run. It's called the IGH programme. It's a multi-professional programme and it's a programme where NHS staff have the opportunity to spend time overseas. Um, that slide just gives you a brief summary. We, it began in 2008 with one overseas partnership um, and since that time uh, it has developed uh, as, as uh, on the slide. You'll see it's the numbers are small. It's a small, fairly niche program, um, but it is quite an important program in terms of the benefit. Um, the aims of the program, um, which are what they were when we set it up back in 2008, and we set it up back in the days of strategic health authorities. Some of you are old enough to remember that structure of the NHS when we had um, strategic health authorities and we were working, I was working in the South Central uh, Strategic Health Authority, which included the Thames Valley and the Wessex areas at the time. So again, uh, on your patch. We developed those aims with partners and with various folk at the time. And the aims, the broad aims have remained the same, which are to um, support the delivery of sustainable improvements in health and healthcare um, with partners in resourceful settings, provide an unparalleled personal leadership development experience for participants, particularly the NHS participants, and to create a cadre of skilled workers that bring back skills to the NHS. And it started um, uh, as a result of a report that Nigel wrote back in 2007 um, that I referred to earlier. I had a, a picture of earlier. And it was the first time in Nigel's report of uh, global partnerships, it was the first time that a formal report had recognised the mutual benefit of such opportunities. A lot of people in the NHS are very altruistically minded, very keen to offer and share skills that they've had the opportunity to develop. And that's been going on for years and years and years. Um, it's also been recognised for years and years and years that the people who participate in such schemes learn a huge amount themselves. But it's not been... It, hadn't ever been so formally recognised. And Nigel's report in 2007 was the first formal report to really recognise that. And so that was part of the, the premise that this programme was built on, that the NHS volunteers would contribute hugely, but it was recognised they would gain hugely. And we wanted to be intentional about that. We didn't want that to be seen as a secondary or a byproduct. We wanted that to be seen as intentional with the idea of a sort of equal partnership. Everyone has something to give, everyone has something to learn. Feeling that that was a, a more respectful way to approach partnership working. Um, and so that's how it was uh, set up. Um, The other thing that's unusual about the part about the scheme is that while people spend time overseas, and I'm talking now about how it ran before COVID, uh, I hope you'll uh, recognise that people would spend six months with an overseas partner and they do not provide direct patient care. That is not their role. That's not to say that's not important, but lots of other schemes do that. So this was intended to be a different sort of scheme. And so what they do do is they work in partnership with the partner 
and during that time they work on system development, system strengthening projects using quality improvement methods. Um, the work that they do is determined by the overseas in-country partner, it's not an NHS determined piece of work. Uh, the role of the programme is to help shape the piece of work into something that is feasible to be delivered collaboratively in the six month uh, period of the placement. And then at the end of the placement, um, typically the work may continue and may be, may be taken forward by a follow on IGH fellow. It may be continued by the overseas team on their own. There, there may be no longer a need for um, a coordinating role by a, a fellow. Hello. Um, or it may have become embedded in local practice and so is no longer a project. Um, it's, it's become custom and practice in the local area. All the projects um, have to link with one of the uh, sustainable um, development goals, which as we know are worldwide goals supported by the United Nations. And the, this, the, the sustainable development goals were developed in 2015 and are a broad range and include the wider determinants of health. And so they include things like um, poverty, food security, education, gender empowerment, um, access to clean water, all of which link with health, but may not be direct, are not necessarily directly health related. Some examples of recent projects that you might be interested in um, to show the range of project work uh, are listed here. So there's one, we have a partnership in Lesotho, that small little mountain kingdom in the middle of South Africa. And there's an ongoing, as, you, as I'm sure you can tell, uh, project of work to help create a culture of quality improvement at that hospital. Um, another recent project is to improve appropriate escalation and management of deteriorating patients on medical wards. Um, and I'm sure you can read the list uh, yourself. So improving medication safety in medical wards. And so these are all things that um, are important and the local partner wants some attention to and work done. But as you look at them, um, none of them are alien to the things that we would want to have happen necessarily in the UK. So often the, the, the skills developed are very particular to the piece of work and they themselves, um, by virtue of the fellow leading and coordinating that piece of work, are very helpful to them on their return uh, to the UK. The... Um, uh -huh. Ah, this is very interesting. Ah, here we go. The uh, model, so the fellowship itself is based on a development model. Um, and it's based on a development model called vertical leadership development. Sometimes the word leadership creates antibodies, we know, but we're talking about personal leadership, not positional leadership. So these are leadership behaviours that we hope everyone wants to develop no matter what their position is. So these are these are these transcend position. So it doesn't matter where you sit in the hierarchy, these are behavioral. And the, the model that this development uh, is based on is based on, uh, on a model described uh, by somebody called Nick Petrie. I don't know if you can read the, um, the, the reference there, but I can share these slides. And he talks about um, for behavioral change, uh, you need three types of things to have happen. You need a heat experience, which is as described um, as he describes, um, which is something that takes you out of your comfort zone um, that because of that, you, you have to have your mind open and you have to be creative to be able to learn from that experience. And obviously going overseas uh, to a new culture, to a completely new system, to a place where you know no one 
um, it is certainly could be described as a heat experience. So it doesn't have to be an overseas, but a, an overseas experience is definitely a heat experience. When you're in this new um, out of your comfort zone experience, you are um, you, you meet people with different perspectives, different cultures, different ways of doing things, people who may think differently from you. Um, and because our volunteers are not um, doing day to day uh, patient management, they have ability, the, the opportunity, if you like, to take a broader view. Uh, and so they start to look at things from a system or process uh, perspective, rather than concentrating on the clinic or the patient in front of them. So again, this is another way of, of them learning. And those perspectives can collide. You may meet, you know, you may come across ways of doing things, beliefs and behaviours, that, that you don't understand. Uh, and it's important that you spend some time be uh, curious about those things in order to learn. And then the third part of this trilogy that he describes being really key to the learning, this ability to make sense of your experience, is having a coach or a mentor and the ability to formally reflect on your experiences to gain the learning from them. And that's the side where we talk about the intentional side so that we prepare people to be able to formally reflect. Um, and they also have access to um, a coach in the UK, uh, a mentor uh, coach in the UK to help them make sense of their experiences. The tool that we use to um, for people to focus around their behaviours is this NHS healthcare leadership model, which is a behavioural model. It's a little bit old now. It was um, developed in 2013. And some of the language um, may feel a bit 2013-ish, um, but actually it's a very helpful behavioural leadership model. And that's what we base the learning on. We have people do some self-assessment work using that before they go, focus on some domains that they'd like to focus on while they're out there um, during their placement. And they have those conversations with their mentor. Um, and then they self-assess on their return to see what development they have, um, they have made uh, um, according to their own ability to self-assess. We also encourage people to use a second thing, which is a, a Health Education England developed toolkit, which is a really good, um, I would say this, wouldn't I, a really good way of recording a diverse range of experiences. And that's designed to be used um, in an appraisal or some other conversation with a line manager as a way of collecting evidence of skills developed, um, behaviours developed, experiences had that may be very useful for, a, you know, as I say, a conversation with a line manager in an appraisal situation in terms of looking forward to how those skills may be used and behaviours uh, in, in the future role. And then my last slide, um, we, we've, we do some evaluation work um, every few years and uh, we th this is just some interesting uh, data, I think. So this it describes two groups of people. First group of people we, we um, surveyed who completed placements in the period 2008 to 2015. And then the second group who'd completed placements 2015 to 2018. So why did people apply? That's the reasons they like overseas experience and they want some concentrated personal development. We ask them to tell us, do they think they've developed as a leader? And again, this is referred to as personal leadership based on the NHS healthcare leadership model. As you can see, 78% of the first group felt they had, 94% of the second group. And key to us is on their return to the NHS, are they able to use whatever learning, however they describe that, whether that be technical, whether that be thinking learning, whether that be innovations, whatever that is, are they able to use that in the current role back in the NHS, which is key to, to, to what we're about? And as you can see from those, those, those are encouraging uh, replies. It's all based on self-report. Uh, so again, that's important, um, but it's very encouraging in terms of people's ability to use what they have learned. Um, so I'm going to close that now because that is my slides finished and I'm very happy to take any questions 
Thank you. But the first question is uh, for Dr Kitzel and are there any mental health focus projects currently happen happening in Health Education England? So when you say in Health Education England, um, can we ask the questioner, is, is that in general or is that in, rev in, in um, relation to that programme? I think there was a bit of both. So is there any mental health focused um, projects going on in health education at the minute? And are there any projects that you were just talking about that are mental health focused? OK, I think so our first trust. So we've got some in adult and some in mental health. So I think that's where the question come from. So mental health in health education England, there's a whole national team um, that take care of mental health and in that can include new roles um, as well you know there's a lot of work and investment going on into talking therapies with the various um, CBT cognitive behavioral therapy therapists and, and skills um, but the best way to find out about that for the UK side is to go via your local office so that would be the Thames Valley team in the Southwest local office who will be able to give you access to the huge programme of mental health work focus that's going on for Health Education England in the UK. Um, and I can give you contacts following this if you don't know uh, the contacts in those offices if you'd like me to. Um, in terms of overseas, so currently, because of COVID, we have no one overseas. We had to bring everybody back last March. Um, and so currently there isn't uh, because there is no um, uh, focus work going on. And work is, because work is um, developed by the um, overseas partner, we have had mental health programs of work and it might be systems and processes around mental health, management of mental health, uh, patients with mental health um, um, conditions. It may have been, um, I can remember a, a program of work some years ago about facilities um, with a partner, overseas partner, where the facilities for the management of people with mental health problems was not were not great and so some work um, went into helping to improve those facilities as well as it would tend to focus on the more generic side you know you know the kind of thing of upskilling um, people with general skills it, we we don't work at the specialist level um, because that requires uh, more specialist teams and there are other people who do that there are mental health trusts who have partnerships with overseas organizations uh, and other stuff but we have certainly done some education and training through a project uh, with more generic uh, mental health training so i hope that may answer that question thank, thank you. you i'm sure it does thank you becky are there any other uh, short questions before we move on not at the moment Thank you. Thank you very much, Fleur. That was a really informative presentation. We'll now move on to Christine Capopo, who is our Associate Director of Nursing here at Oxleys. Christine, are you able to share your slides now? Okay, thank you, Jane, for the introduction. I'm Christine Capopo, as Jane said. I am the Associate Director of Nursing here at uh, Oxleys. Um, with my presentation, I'd like to start with uh, talking a bit about nursing and nurses. I'm very, I was very happy to hear the previous speakers validate my first slide. Uh, they said exactly what I wanted to hear them say about nursing. So I view nursing as a widely, I mean, I view nursing as, uh, I understand nursing is widely acknowledged as a highly complex, demanding profession that requires knowledgeable, skilled and critical thinkers and doers. So to be a nurse, uh, you know, you need to be a critical thinker and doer, and the job itself is co highly complex and demanding. Um, nursing requires huge amounts of dedication, commitment, and hard work. Um, and we've seen that with the pandemic, uh, that nurses have really, really worked hard and have been dedicated and committed to supporting uh, patients that have uh, needed care. Uh, nurses have viewed are trusted professionals, and I think everybody knows that there have been the 
voted the most trusted professionals uh, year after year, and I'm glad to be part of that group. And they have an ability to influence and improve healthcare, but also influence and um, um, improve uh, agendas. We're here today because of the initiatives of two nurses, Moses and, Moses and, and John, who spoke about this initiative, and here we are today because they have influenced the agenda here at Oxley's. Nurses worldwide constitute the majority of the global health care workforce and are uniquely positioned to engage with others to address disparities in health care and to achieve the goal of better health for, others, uh, for everybody. This new partnership uh, we're embarking on gives us a unique opportunity to participate um, and collaborate with Kenyan colleagues to identify effective ways of working together. Uh, within our respective uh, healthcare systems and also um, uh, with it internationally to lead and um, engage in research and innovation. So I was just saying about the um, partnership we're embarking on with Kenya, uh, which gives us a unique opportunity to participate and collaborate with Kenyan colleagues to identify ways of working together within our respective healthcare systems uh, to improve uh, the care we deliver as nurses uh, and also to innovate and embark on research. The model we propose to work with Kenya is, is not unidirectional uh, flow of knowledge and skills, but would like to follow the equitable partnership. And uh, now Fleur talked about uh, mutual benefit and working in collaboration, and that's the model we would like to uh, follow with this partnership. Uh, a bit about innovation, and because this will be uh, one of the focuses uh, in our partnership. Innovation obviously is around improving uh, systems, improving outcomes, improving efficiencies within systems, and also adding value in the form of efficacy and effectiveness. So this is one of the areas that we need, we, we are wishing to focus on in terms of our partnership with Kenya. It's the generation of new ideas, and this is something nurses do all the time, the application of existing uh, ideas to new situations. This is the critical appraisal of research that has already been undertaken and its application to practice. And these activities we already um, engage in as nurses. And what we'd like to do now is take it forward and have that partnership and look at research that exists already and its application to practice, but also develop new knowledge, new bodies of knowledge that we can actually um, share across the two countries. At the moment, as I said, I can confidently say nurses in Nairobi and here at Oxley's are engaged in innovation activities and they have uh, that have been translated to sophisticated nursing practices, nurse education and in nurse leadership. These activities have been motivated mainly by the need to improve care outcomes for patients and for the people who we work with in terms of uh, carers and the voluntary sector. Uh, many of these developments have actually resulted in uh, significant improvements. Um, at Oxley's, at the moment, uh, nurses are participating in uh, quality improvement projects using the IHI uh, QI methodology. Um, when I last looked at the data, um, this is the data from 2020, um, nurses were leading and engaged in projects. So there were a total of 44 uh, quality improvement projects in, within the organization, and nine of those uh, projects were nest led. That's about 20% of the projects were nest led. And um, nurses participated and contributed to the remaining projects. Uh, in terms of training and the QI methodology, nurses have actually um, undertaken. Um, the training and we have, well, we had at that point 307 nurses trained in QI methodology. Uh, this just demonstrates how nurses um, engage in innovation uh, and uh, are always working to improve the quality of care they deliver. As you heard Matthew say, um, Oxley's is one of the few mental health trusts within um, England that have been rated outstanding for, care, for caring, which is a domain that nurses uh, particularly participate in. Right, so the next 
area would like to engage in with our Kenyan partners our res is research. As you know, the word research um, induces terror or disinterest amongst the nurses. Uh, but uh, according to Ruth May, the Chief Nursing Officer in, uh, for England, the implementation of evidence base can be achieved uh, by creating the right culture, uh, the right leadership at the point of care. So basically, although nursing, the word research uh, induces terror within nurses, with the right culture, with the right leadership, we can change this. And there's other evidence uh, that um, supports this that uh, basically managerial factors within an organization or within a social system can encourage and support or discourage and impede nurses to participate in research activities. Obviously, we would like to be the latter, uh, sorry, the former. So um, engage, nurses getting engaged in, in research is actually in tandem with Oxley's nursing strategy, which uh, we're coming to the end of. And this aims to support nurses to develop and become active, um, active at, at improving care through research application and through QI methodologies. So before I talk about anything else, uh, I'd just like to share my COVID uh, reflections um, my key takeaway from the pandemic is uh, how responsive nurses and have been through, throughout the pandemic. They had everything thrown at them from having to reconfigure services in a short uh, period of time, you know, given short notice, to having to change roles, leaving their usual roles to go and work in completely new teams, doing completely new things. They've risen up to the challenge and they've adapted and they've worked really tirelessly to support people um, that needed their care. Nurses have had to learn, especially the mental health nurses, have had to learn new nursing practices in the arena of infection prevention and control. Uh, the donning and doffing is, more, is uh, a very new experience to most uh, mental health nursing, but they've got on with it and they've um, hit the ground running. On our wards, uh, nurses, especially the mental health nurses, have had to manage patients uh, um, uh, quite sensitively, quite uh, empathetically, uh, especially with um, the restrictions imposed on the patients by the lockdowns. So normally patients can go and come as they wish, but with the pandemic, the lockdown and the lockdown restrictions, uh, we've had to work with patients who cannot do that any longer. And nurses have had to work really compassionately with these patients to just manage those restrictions, which have been difficult in everybody. We know that uh, referrals have steadily increased, not only in terms of volume, but in terms of complexity. In Oxley's, we've seen a rise in the number of people who have been detained under the Mental Health Act and have come to receive care on our wards. This wasn't previously the case. So the acuity of the patients we've seen has gone up, but nurses have adapted and have, uh, have risen to the challenge and given the support that's um, been required. And we know that COVID has accelerated the use of technology. People can now have uh, video consultations with nurses if they choose. But having said that, this has also provide, uh, has created um, uh, inequality in care in that um, although, that, although this platform is available, it's not available to every, everybody. Nurses have continued with their face-to-face -face consultations right throughout the pandemic, despite the risks to themselves and the risks to the patient. They have gone out and then uh, provided these face-to-face -face consultations where needed or where the patient is unable to engage digitally. Right, um, I'd like to take a few minutes to acknowledge the last, largest part of nursing workforce at Oxley's and these are the nurses uh, providing care in the community to people in their own homes. The real lesson over the pandemic is how we, how critical this uh, work, uh, workforce is and how we need to build and develop a strong community workforce. The pandemic has seen the district nurses uh, delivering more end of life care. End of life care has always been an arena where district nurses have been involved in. But with the pandemic, we've had a lot of people, a lot more people choosing to die from home. So um, they have delivered the volume of end of life care they've seen, it has increased. Unfortunately, 
those who have been cared for, have ha who have had a COVID, a COVID positive diagnosis and have received end of life care, that end of life care has tended to be really short. So our nurses have seen more deaths during this period than they have ever seen in most of their careers. And obviously, during the pandemic, emphasis has been on prevention of admission and early discharge. And the district nurses and all the other nurses working in the community have had to pick up these um, pick up um, these patients and support them within their own homes, which has been a bit of a stretch, but they have managed to do that safely and compassionately. Uh, children and young people are a group of people who were invisible during the first wave of the pandemic. I think what we saw what we saw was a focus on the vulnerability of adults during the first wave. However, as time went on in England, we saw that um, an a COVID-19 related inf inflammatory syndrome emerged within the children. But later on, um, we saw with the closing of schools, the factors of socializing, the protective factors of socializing and children going to school were no longer there and children are impacted upon differently. The impact wasn't necessarily uh, from the virus itself, but it was more from the isolation or the, that uh, lockdown uh, had created for them. Ofsted, which is a regulatory body that look after schools and mostly ch and children, um, report that children lost physical fitness and others are showing signs of mental distress manifesting in an increase in eating disorders and self-harm. Post-COVID, we need to rise to the challenges that have uh, been created by the pandemic. And one thing we've heard um, um, repeatedly is that nursing are feeling really exhausted. They're on their knees. And as such, our post-COVID uh, nursing strategy will focus on addressing the factors um, that are impacting on our workforce, because we know that the quality of care that patients receive really depends on the skill, compassion and dedication of staff. To take this forward, uh, Oxley's will be drawing upon the inspiration and the recommendation of the Courage of Compassion report that was published by uh, King's in uh, 2020. Um, they uh, uh, presented a model, the ABC model of, um, sorry, the ABC framework um, for nurses and midwives. It describes the core needs of nurses and midwives, midwives at work. So to ensure the uh, well-being and motivation, um, evidence suggests that people have three core needs at work, and these are autonomy, belonging, and contribution. And earlier in his speech, Matthew touched on this, and I think Jane touched on this as well. So we'll be focusing on the needs of our nurses, inspired by this document, and basically creating more autonomy within the nursing workforce, a sense of belonging, and this is in keeping with our trust values that Matthew mentioned earlier, and making sure that nurses feel a sense of agency the first a sense that they are contributing to the team and they're contributing to the outcomes of the patients in their care. Right, so I'm just going to focus on the, um, the four areas we're going to um, look at or we're going to include in our nursing strategy going forward. Obviously, uh, research and innovation is one of them, and this is a key area that we will be collaborating with Kenya on. Uh, we hope to uh, innovate and develop nursing practice with Kenya. We want our organization, uh, the nurses in our organization, to be active in research uh, to improve uh, patient outcomes. And, you know, um, the other thing we want to do is look at the existing evidence base and see how we can better apply that to practice to make sure that the care we deliver is effective. The other thing we'll be really focusing on is optimising the workload uh, of our nursing workforce through safe staffing reviews. This is a practice that we already undertake, but we'll be take, undertaking it rigorously to acknowledge the increased workload from uh, practices such as donning, doffing, practices such as isolation on the inpatient wards and, um, you know, the increased time people have to spend with people because of the increased acuity on the wards. 
Uh, management and supervision is something we will invest in, and especially um, restorative supervision. My next slide actually looks at the mo model of restorative supervision. And basically, it's a model that was uh, created by Sally Wallbank in uh, 2009. I think she developed and updated it in 2012. Um, the model shows that when professionals such as nurses undertake complex and uh, clinical work, the move between anxiety, fear and stress, so, so they're really, really stressed because of the complexity of the work. And this is where our workforce generally is at the moment. But if they can process these natural feelings healthily, they, can they are able then to identify the learning needs and focus on that. And once they do that, they're able to en enter this creative, energetic, solution-focused zone, allowing them to actually um, thrive and uh, perform at work. So restorative supervision is something we're going to invest in. At the moment, we have colleagues who have applied to, um, um, to, to train how to deliver restorative supervision uh, under the Professional Nursing Advocate Scheme, which I think was commissioned by Health Education England. So we're looking forward to the completion, uh, our colleagues completing this course so that they can come back to us and support their teams. But meanwhile, extra support will be sought out uh, elsewhere through our commissioning. Um, another area of focus, uh, this is the fourth area of focus, is around learning, education and development. Uh, we want to ensure that the right systems, frameworks and processes are in place for nurses to learn and develop and actually reach the, uh, you know, the top of, uh, sorry, develop within the career ladder so that they're practicing at the top of their line sense. And we are working very hard with the heads of nursing and each directorate to identify these training needs, uh, these, which are derived from personal development plans and will inform our training needs analysis and our commissioning this year. Um, we also uh, hope to introduce the role of um, advanced clinical practitioner within our teams. Now, we have a few colleagues who are training to be advanced clinical practitioners, but we haven't quite worked out um, where they'll go and how they'll work within teams. So Jane and others within the South London Partnership are working very hard with colleagues within our organisation to influence this. We want more nurses working at the top of their licence, influencing practice. The advanced clinical practitioner roles allows nurses uh, to um, lead in clin clinical practice, to, in facilitating learning and clinical leadership and in um, leading on research and innovation. So we want to bring in these colleagues into our teams so that they influence the uh, quality of care we're delivering. And those are the four areas we're going to focus on. Um, I'll stop there and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Christine. That was an excellent presentation. Becky, are there any questions for Christine in the chat or any comments that you'd like to share? Hi, everyone. So, not, I'm thinking maybe now we've got quite a few viewers, it might be time to do a poll. So I'd like to pull it to the panel. What kinds of questions would you like me to put out there to see what our viewers are thinking? <laughs> That's a really good opportunity, Becky. Um, I'd like to put out there to them to ask them what their priorities would be for a global partnership. What would the top things that they would like to see happen in the next 12 months, for example? And it could be between um, Oxley's and, and our Kenyan Love partners. It. Had a comment come in as Lovely. I will put that out there, Jane. And we've just had a comment come in as well, just uh, reflecting on Christine's presentation, that they completely agree with Christine that advanced practitioner roles are the way to go. That's music to our ears because we have a number in training and we really want to create the roles for them across the spectrum of different opportunities that we have in the organisation. And where we have got them in post, they're absolutely flying and making a huge difference. Thank you. Okay then, I think we shall move on now to um, Frances Adzinku, our Associate Director of Mental Health in Bexley Care. Uh, Frances, are you able to uh, put your slides up? Great, thanks Jane, thanks very much. And um, 
before uh, I go on, I want to say thank you for the organizers and uh, welcome to everyone. And I'm also going to make an attempt of saying that in uh, uh, Swahili, which is Karibu or Mwaliko, and also in Ewe from the West African region, I come from Awezo. So you're welcome and thank you very much for doing for take, uh, allowing me to talk about my experience over the years in a small group in the UK who got together and decided to do something different and also to share experiences. We called ourselves mental health educators in the diaspora. Majority of us were Oxley's employees. We had a few colleagues from um, other neighboring tribes, but it was mainly Oxley's staff who got together to say, look, we've got this experience. How do we go into sharing this locally and also uh, look for links abroad? And that is that experience that I want to share very quickly with, uh, uh, with everyone. So, Who were we? So we're a, a group of, uh, as I said, of professionals, but we were made up of nurses, social workers, occupational therapists, doctors, etc. Luckily, we also had a lecturer from uh, the University of, the, of Greenwich at the time who was helping us develop some of the curriculum of some of the bits and uh, things that we wanted to do. And why did we want to do this? As I said earlier, we thought we had gained quite uh, some knowledge. We had gained a lot of experiences and uh, some of our colleagues were translating some of uh, the literature and mental health to be used locally in uh, in Ghana. But we, cut, we, we did some visits to other uh, West African countries as well. Um, and it, it, it was a very interesting and inspiring uh, period. The question that we had at the time was what exactly were we going to do and how were we going to do it? How are we going to share this knowledge? And um, we met regularly in, in um, Oxley's premises. We agreed that we we're going to take uh, some annual leave. So we usually took about three weeks in June from the beginning of June towards the end of June. Uh, we designed and agreed teaching slides locally, but uh, also in consultation with the host country as to exactly what we needed to do. Um, we linked in with uh, the International Office of Migration because we needed some support. So. We were using our own annual leave. We were traveling down. We needed to book flights, et cetera. And we had some support with some of the flight, but the rest was all down to us. Now, I'm saying this, this was around 2000, to, from 2000 to 2004, for quite a few years until we stopped uh, traveling, possibly about four years ago, four or five years ago, and have just had a meeting to discuss again. But what I'm sharing here is some of the learning that we, we had to do, some of the learning before, after some of the things that we've done, and some of the work that we did with the host country. I've put the learning, the culture, that was extremely important. We needed to understand the culture we were going into. We were making our assumptions because initially, when we started our investigations, some of us thought, well, we, 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 we know those countries, we've lived there before, we understand what is going on. No, we had no clue. Things were different, things had changed, and our meaning of time had changed. And an example of that is you go into a, you, you, you book a meeting and you agree a time and trying to uh, get people to uh, attend at that particular time that you have in your diary was something else and it was you really needed to you really needed to understand what time meant for different cultures we also needed to re uh, 
re-educate ourselves to um, the language. And it's, it's, it's also understanding the local language. There are loads of other cultural aspects, but I think this collaboration with Kenya is going to give us the experience to learn more about Kenya, the Kenya, more about Kenyan culture, how we engage with, with individuals. Because again, from our or my experience, some of the things where you don't go into a room and think you know it all. And that came, that came up as a, a big issue and I would touch uh, on some of that. Luckily for us this time, we already have an understanding of what we needed to do. In our case, we need to agree a memorandum of understanding with uh, uh, the host country, and that took some work. Where we'll be hosted, security. We needed to arrange our own transport. So there were lots of things that we needed to do, and those that were going with us, we needed to really manage those expectations. And in managing those expectations, it means that it means that we had to limit some of the things that we do. We did, but to do all this. We need that be at a place which said, we are what we are because of who you are and they are what they are because of what we are. And it's a simple principle of Ubuntu. And I thought it was important to mention that here because some of our learning, uh, I still have it now. I'm gonna move on to the, um, the next slide, which is, so we went, with the assumption of teaching in classrooms and also training on the wards. So and we did a lot of that. But what we needed to focus on was some of these places had very few psychiatrists. So you might have a, a hospital of close to 600 patients with one or two psychiatrists. And the nursing staff, especially the nursing staff, needed to be at a caliber that they could do more than what we as nurses in the UK are doing, have done, and hopefully are trying to change. So though we were teaching mental health and working on uh, mental health wards, we're also doing bits where if there was no psychiatrist, where what would you do? And there's a, a very interesting literature on that that I'm happy to share uh, if people want uh, later. The second thing was we, we had to uh, generate um, systems. And I think past, some of the past presenters have uh, spoken about it. So you go into a place thinking you're going to teach mental health, but really you go in there to set up systems, look at structures, support. And some of the systems that I was involved in um, was designing uh, inpatient uh, wards, actual facilities, helping people, look at ligature and a few other bits. That's just one. On a particular, on some of the wards that we worked on, there were close to, let's say, between 60 and 100 patients. And more often than not, there might be four or five staff, but how do you manage the number of patients? So we were developing primary nursing principles and also on one occasion, one of the wards had close to 50, uh, sorry, over 50 students. We needed to start looking at how we did mentorship. So we started putting structures uh, apart from just the general teaching. Substance misuse was a place, one of the areas that we covered. Also uh, explored home treatment. But it was interesting because with the home treatment team in particular, this, some of the cultures that we were working with there's a lot of stigma about mental health. So home treatment was one of the things that was much easier to start engaging with people, to be able to start looking at their relatives if the institutions got involved. And also the institutions didn't have enough uh, staff to be able to cope with all that was happening in the community. I mean, re rehabilitation, I, can, uh, I mean, we did a bit of that, but there was a, a need for control and restraint. And that was one of the areas that uh, the, 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 the nurses, the staff, and the students were asking for. But in, in, in what we do here, control and, control and restraint has various structures that you, need, you needed to carry out. You needed a certain number of people, you need some regular monitoring. So we had to talk people out of it 
and look at better ways of managing aggression. And it, it, one of the principles that are used in forensic psychiatry is relational security. They did it better. Their relationships with patients were much better. Another area that I thought uh, I, I personally needed to get involved in was majority of uh, some of these countries have prayer camps where patients are kept in, uh, in, in churches and they're kept in those churches and being treated in those churches. And I think there was a while ago when one of the, uh, like a few of the churches needed support and said, if you don't support us and we release this, this patient into the community, you would have quite a huge number, over six to 600 to 1,000 patients on the street. So we went into the churches to see how we could engage with prayer, spirituality, and also medicine. So we, I mean, that was some of the work uh, that we were doing. My next slide is, so what I was saying was, I went in there thinking uh, I was going to teach mental health. I was going to get involved in a, uh, uh, maybe imparting knowledge. I came back taught. I learned a lot. I was rather impressed by some of the work that was already uh, being carried uh, carrying on. And I think uh, one of the ex speakers said, Look, there's a lot of experience, expertise. What I noticed was that staffing levels were low, but they used engagement. Almost all the staff were well trained, whereas here we focus on mental health or we focus on physical health. Almost all of them are well trained and then they specialize. Most of them were physician uh, assist assistants running their own outpatient clinics. The expertise was high. I mean, past presenters had mentioned autonomy, belonging, and contribution. There was a lot of that. I learned a lot, and no joke, I learned a lot about compassionate care. I was on a ward with, uh, it was a female ward with about 60 patients and about five staff. And one of the things that I just just struck me was how the staff were engaging with the patient. They were sitting, plaiting hair, doing other bits and pieces. And when other patients wanted to either get a bit uh, rowdy, you would find that there was, uh, it wasn't only the staff that got involved, other patients helped calm the situation. So the environment was managed together. There was a good relationship. And this led me to think, I'm doing a study on uh, compassion, and that led me to do more on my work around um, compassion. What I want to do is understand how we could enhance it. And this collaboration is going to be a rich source of information for me. Sorry. So, my last, uh, my, my last two slides. So after we came back, one of the things that we needed to do was decide how we carried on. But we realized that we only spent a very short time there. So it would be about um, three weeks, two to three weeks. Some of us stayed the whole three weeks. Some did a week and left. So what we developed was uh, telephone support, WhatsApp group. We did some, uh, sent some literature, I still do, uh, looked for references. We supported some of the Mental Health Act development and I understand from a colleague that it is, uh, they are now going into implementation plan of Mental Health Act, uh, of the Mental Health Act. And what I'm saying is that I'm sharing this to say there's a lot that we're going to do and I'm extremely excited <laughs> that I am really involved in this. And then some of the staff that we trained joined other organizations, they improved their, uh, their environment, some of them work in charities. And I would say that some of them are here in the UK working. And it's interesting because some of them, I know a couple who were running their own outpatient clinics 
but they are here as band five nurses. They need to start somewhere. But I think it's acknowledging that there is a lot of expertise, there's a lot of learning that we're also going to get in this collaboration. For us, compassion is something I learned. I learned that even with very low staffing numbers, we can still do a lot. How we support staff, I learned a lot about collaboration, working jointly. So I've come back and I work very closely with churches and I'm sure colleagues on the line know I do a lot in the community in Bexley. And uh, well, I learned it from somewhere. One of the greatest other things is the culture of the society has an impact on mental health. One of the things uh, I picked up was understanding the culture of the people. I've seen people who are very psychotic. And in that culture and in my culture, if somebody is older than you or in authority, you respect that person no matter what. The interesting thing was that patients who were even psychotic would, would approach me and say, hello, sir, or greet me in a formal way. That very culture we have on the streets of London, some of the crimes, the London, the knife crimes, etc., are the cultures and the aggression are some of the cultures that are coming into our inpatient wards. And we need to acknowledge that whatever the culture is in out there, it's happening in mental, in, in, in mental health. I went thinking I had a small idea. I came back thinking there's a lot to do. And then with Moses and John's ideas, it looks like my light bulb moment is turning into something else. It is growing and becoming something different. Um, and I think I'm going to end here and again going to say Asante, if that's the right way, and Akba, and finally, thank you in English. Thanks. Thank you very much, Francis. That was an inspiring, reflective account. And I really would like to hear more about it as well at other times. I just need to let you know, we had a glitch with your slides, uh, but you were presenting full screen so authentically and so passionately, it was brilliant. You didn't need your slides at all, but we can share those with anybody who would like to see them afterwards. So Becky, have Thank we got you. some... Have we got some questions for Francis? We have got questions for Francis, yes. So um, one of the first things that came through was uh, from Rebecca, who's watching on our Vimeo live stream. She says, where were some of the places you went to that had little psychiatric presence? Did you find that a lot of the decision making was being nurse led? And if so, was there any learning that could be brought back to Oxley's? Yeah, so um, yes majority of the decision learning was nurse led and um, there was consultation so i again similarly so an example will be nurse led consultation you consult the consultant so you don't use the consultants as the sole decision makers so one of the things that we're trying to do in oxley's and i think christine touched on that is developing nursing leadership it is important that we develop nursing leadership to a level that we consult nurse consultants and medical consultants, psychologists, but not take, not basically take all the basic decisions to that group. And in uh, the countries that some of us have, some of us have gone to, so we've got doctors who went to Nigeria, uh, we've got some of us went to Ghana. Some others touched on Cameroon and a few other places, uh, quite, quite a few. And that's not all we need. We also have telephone support. But the most important thing to understand is that a lot of this were nurse led, as I said earlier, and in Oxley's, when we improve our nursing knowledge and leadership through research, education, support, I think we will get there. And in collaboration with Kenyan colleagues, I believe that we are going to learn a lot of this nurse-led approaches. And then we have another comment saying, uh, well, comment question. One of the issues that most uh, DS4 or health professionals find difficult is that they move to the UK from a managerial post 
and when they come to the NHS they struggle to move up the career ladder. How would this be addressed looking at the vast experience some of those staff have before entering the UK so that they may not end up working with urgency? I think um, Jane and Matthew touched on a uh, part of that about the leadership of um, the leadership and I guess maybe the the, the glass ceiling, et cetera. And I think there's, I think we're doing a lot of work around that. One of the areas that we're focusing on, and I belong to a BME men's national group and other, um, uh, what do you, other groups, uh, nursing groups that are looking at how we improve this. And I acknowledge, I know um, uh, quite a few people in Oxley's who were matrons in wherever they came from. And they've come in at junior levels, partly because my experience of going to teach, if I had gone there, I would not have gone as a senior staff because I needed to understand a lot of things. I needed to understand the culture. I really needed to understand how things function. After understanding that, I would then need support to then move up the ladder. And I think that is what we are doing because before you come into the UK, to work, you have to pass um, a language test, and a lot of people have done that. I know somebody who's failed that what two or three times, even they speak very good English. So it's part of the questions are asked about the culture. We need to understand that. There's a lot of work that we need to do locally to break that glass ceiling, but there's also work we need to do with colleagues who understand what a glass is made out of. This feeds lovely into our next kind of question and comment, which is, I think, aimed towards maybe Matthew and Jane. So how can we develop a sustainable and mutual programme that address this work for gap identified? And how can we develop the capacity to address these clinical needs to ensure good outcomes for our service users? Yeah, I'll, I'll come in on that. I think, I mean, what we're trying to do here today, I think, is to start to forge more formally some of these relationships and think about how we do do this. I mean, it's very striking listening to Francis talking there and thinking about how open are we to listen to the experiences of people in other, in working in other countries and in other healthcare settings. I mean, I know Francis and I have been out to visit some of the, the churches in Bexley and some of the faith groups in Bexley where he's been doing some really inspiring work to support those groups, to support people who are struggling with mental ill health. And it's it's about listening and learning from people's expertise. And I'm, I'm very struck by his point that someone can be in a very senior post overseas and comes into the NHS and we expect to start them you know, quite low down the ladder and then we make it quite difficult for them to progress. And that, that does risk us really losing access to some real expertise and insight as well. So that there's a lot that we're learning today to forge those partnerships and understand how we tackle this together. Lovely. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Becky, I think uh, in the interest of time, we'll move on to uh, Dr. John Foster from the University of Greenwich, who's going to um, share a, a specialist subject area with us. Uh, John, over to you. Are you able to share your slides? I will do my best, Jane. Let me just, I'll see how we go. I'm going to say, uh, talk about something rather different than what most of the previous speakers have um, spoken about. Thank you very much for giving me a chance for this, this opportunity. Um, I've worked quite closely with Francis over a long period of time, so Francis knows me quite well. Um, and one of the and we had we've had a number of meetings about about this collaboration and the one thing that we have identified is that there's a lot of expertise around substance misuse and substance use in this in this group particularly John and particularly Moses and particularly Francis and I've been asked largely to um, provide the, the sort of research um, input expertise I suppose um, into this group. And, at the, and to be fair, at, the, at this moment in time, that's at a very rudimentary stage. So we, I, I suppose that's the sort of, so we're all thinking about how that's going to work. So instead of doing that, I thought I would have some personal reflections on teaching substance use to mental health students. Uh, I've been doing it now for about 18, 20 years, something like that. And most of the groups I've been talking to have been very ethnically diverse. Many of them have gone on to work at Oxley's themselves. I've also taught, I teach at a CPD level. I teach right through from master's right through to PhD. So 
I, I, I got a sort of uh, perspective right across the sort of student um, journey, if you like. Um, so I thought I would do that. And it's interesting when you talk about sudden shifts, and that's where we are focused on, is one of the issues are is that many people, students, come with very, very, um, they come with a lot of preconceptions, which they possibly don't have about maybe psychosis, maybe, or depression or anxiety. And so it's a really, it's quite a complex thing to do. Um, oh dear, my slides have messed up around, have they? Okay, I think I know what that is. Um, the, I, and when I was talking about this, um, uh, Pro, this, this sort of topic I was thinking well what do I actually do and then I thought well what are my philosophies and what am I about how I teach uh, substance misuse and one of my the philosophies that I use is to actually think is to try what, what I call normalize it so to so that people understand that we're all drug users or most of us are at some, at some level uh, and we all, all use drugs for similar reasons because ultimately we like the effect they gave us, even if it's at, at a small level. Um, and um, so, uh, so, so, so I, so, and I have an exercise that I do with the students, and it, and I ask, and I, well, I generally focus on alcohol, and I ask them, no, why do you, why do you drink, and why, and I, and I. Get a whole list of these of these there's reasons that come up on, onto the, onto a board, uh, usually a, 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 a sort of flip chart. That's the way we tend to do it. And what I tend to do then, and then and is to come is to make the connection is that the our, our reasons for drug use, the reasons why we take drugs, alcohol, coffee, whatever, uh, is almost identical to the reasons why our service users do. Um, and when you start doing that, that, you can start beginning to break down some of the attitudes that that are that are carried about substance misusers because often they are seen as presenting being a management problem and management difficulty. Um, and so we, you try and break that down. So you try and break, get a sort of understanding of where so where are substance misusers come and the difficulties they face. So, and some of those difficulties are around particularly moving into areas where, where most of their peers will be drug users or alcohol, use, or, or alcohol users, and also issues around social exclusion and things like that. So, they, so to, to extent, it's an understanding that for many of our, substance, our service users, substance issues, in a sense, fills their day. Uh, and so... If you so, it's more. It's not about. It's sort of not sort of seeing it necessarily as a pathological behaviour, but understanding that it's a behaviour that has a function for them. And when you start doing that, you can begin to to be, to, to start understanding what it is that the sort of the challenges that it comes when working with people of substance misuse, um, with substance use, with substance misuse. The next slide. I'm having slight problems with looking at my slides, actually, but never mind. I do know what that slide is. Um, it's um, I have another exercise where I, again, we're looking at trying to tease out attitudes, all those types of things towards substance use and addiction in particular. Um, so so we, we again, we do a similar sort of brainstorming exercise. You know, what, what do you see as an, an addict? Um, what are your you know, yeah, and, and usually you get things like unkempt, uh, on the streets, all those types of things. You sh and you, th th you do get some quite positive things as well, but often you don't have to go too far to tease out the sort, the the the, 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 the element of judgment about an addict. So you, you can work with that, but I also the other thing I do is to ask the question um, about. Are our service users addicts? And classically, they're not really. Um, an addict, to some extent, has an insight that their behaviour, uh, um, their, their substance misuse behaviour, has an impact on how on, on what's happening to them. 
for many of our service users, they don't make that connection. So they're not a classic um, addict in that sense. So that we, so we, when we are working with that group, we then have to begin to understand a bit more about where, how ready they are to receive a message about what treatments you can, you can and you can't use. I am having a slight problem with these slides, but I think I know where I'm going now. Yep. So my so so we're, we're now working with the idea that um, our group, our service users, are not classic addicts. And I think the best way to move that is to, is to show the next slide because I do know what's exactly on that slide. Um, this is uh, a slide that I. I showed them, and it's it's about the the types of patterns of drug use. So you have a, you have a sort of occasional use, and then you have a sort of recreational use. Then you have habitual binge use, and then you have dependency at the bottom. And I usually ask the students uh, and Bart, and I often, and I now I do this for my CPD course as well. So I teach um, quite a lot of people on C CPD um, about. You know, to, to more, looking at the sort of teasing about what actually addictions are, it actually is. And I asked them, of your service users, of the people you can clients, how many do you think are dependent? And they will usually come up with an answer of, say, 60, 70 percent. Reality is, in the sense of the classic dependence, which which is about usually around the issue of withdraw, withdrawing from the substance and actually and 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 overall and tolerance to the drug, um, physical addiction, if you like, um, very very few of, of the people that come into a, to to mental health services are, are fit that picture. It's probably about five to ten percent, rather than the classically thought of fifty to sixty percent. Most of our the people that are service users are habitual users or recreational users, and um, what they and generally just like like I would say many of us are habitual users or or, or recreational users of let's say we drink wine or, or beers or whatever, but most of us would resent the idea of being said well you've actually got a problem here guys you've got to address it, um, and. That's the thing. The point is, is that you may be ask, you're giving a you may be giving a message to a service user saying, well, you know, you've got a problem, and they uh, but they won't actually recognise that's the fact. Um, and so, what you then have to do is you then have to begin, and that's the, so the third sort of the philosophy of, to begin to understand what is what is what what can be achieved in terms of a behavioural change. So, it's about understanding where the service user comes from and again i classically use and i'm sure many of you will have seen this next slide the stages of change um it's uh, for people who, who, who've worked with addictions this will be very very familiar um we have the idea that you go through a sort of contemplative stage that brings you then on to a feeling that that you can then deal with your drug use I, I talked to my um, students. Um, sorry, I'm getting messages from other messages, other meetings. Um, I, I talked to the students um, about where they think their service users are in terms of the way in which in which the, how ready they are to change and and. and when you begin to talk to me, it's actually most of the people that we see on the wards, in home treatment teams or whatever, will probably be in a pre-contemplative stage or a contemplative stage. So they, so, at, so they will not really be grasping the idea for many of them that they have a dependency, they, ha they have a, an issues with their substance misuse. And so it, it then becomes about the get to, so what can you actually achieve? Because the, the importance then is to is to think is to is to match what you offer as nurses and doctors or psychologists or whatever um, to what the service user can actually um, accept, I suppose. 
And we, there is a big technique, which I'm sure we, which many of you are familiar with, motivational interviewing, where precisely yeah. we, are doing, we are doing that, in that you, the, the service user, if you like, leads the dialogue. You, you work with their resistance. You challenge it to a degree. But ultimately, it's the service user who works at the service user's pace. And that's what we have to do. And the final, um, I've, although we have that, that's that, uh, that's a really good model. The, the, the stages of change model. It's a re, it's an understandable model. But I prefer this one, which is on the right on the right hand side of that of these of this slide. And this relates to um, en engagement. I see the main skill that nurses have when they work with substance misusers, um, and I, I guess for when we're working about this collaboration, we're thinking how this is going to work in a different cultural setting as well as in the UK, uh, as being long-term engagement, as every possible contact with a, with a service user, which a service user has with educational services, with housing services, with benefit services, all of those types of things are a, um, obviously mental health services, are a potential engagement. And they can either experience that engagement as a positive thing or as a negative thing. And it's, it's important that they are, that we, and it's a positive thing for them. Because you're, what you're doing is you're, you're engaging them over a long period of time. With our, with our, service, our service users, and this, the model that you're actually seeing on the right-hand side is actually one more, it's an old American model, but it's for dual diagnosis um, service users. And they stay, they can stay, they can stay the, the engagement model for the whole of their whole drug using career. They may never get to the point where they're really out of it. They may never re they may never ultimately make that um, link between service between their substance use and their behaviors. But research says that generally there is there over a long period of time there is an improvement. Um, and so what we're trying to do then is to move the um, understanding of nurses, I guess, I suppose, from it's it's about understanding that we're all potential drug users and that we then can work with service users and it's the importance because we have tended to be i think in fair, it's fair to say in previous generations we as being seen as the experts ultimately when you're working with substance misuse um you or any other form of mental illness i guess in the end the only people who can make the changes are service users themselves. We can't do it for them. Um, and I think it's important, the big skill that I like to, the, the big, my main philosophy that I like to, uh, I'm, going to I'm now going to conclude with, engage and uh, to try and inculcate in my students is that we are looking for, wait, right, um, we are going to, um, uh, sorry, we are, is that change is difficult um, and it takes a long period of time and you're working with service users at all points in time and um, we're engaging them. And the key skill is to engage them throughout the sort of substance misuse journey. And I think that is my lot. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. John, thank you very much. That was a very informative presentation. I'm actually going to suggest that we take a 10 minute break now to give people a comfort break and the opportunity to stretch their legs until 10 to when we come back. And I think uh, what I would ask people to do is to put comments and questions into the chat box, please. But one of the areas that we're quite interested in exploring further is this area of substance misuse particularly. So it will give people a little longer to have a think about uh, questions and chat. And we can pick those up later in the conference today. So if that's OK with everybody, we'll take a pause now for 10 minutes and I'll see everybody back here. And we'll start again with, with 10 minutes over uh, the time on the agenda. But I'm sure we'll make good progress and catch up. 
So we'll see you at 10 to. Thank you, everybody. Welcome back, everybody, to the second part of our global conference today. Um, really pleased to be able to invite um, some speakers from Kenya. Um, uh, we have a representative of Dr. Ben Awongya. Um, Dr. Aramond, are you there? Yes, I'm, yes, I'm here, Raymond. Oh, Raymond, hello. Uh, you wanted to say a few words on behalf of Dr. Ben. Yes, I'm, I'd be more than uh, happy. Uh, first of all, apologies for Dr. Ben, who is not able to join. He's a consultant uh, psychiatrist at the uh, KC. Uh, which is a town in Western Kenya. Also, a lecture at the Kisi University School of Medicine, where I, I also lecture. So, uh, on his behalf, he was uh, he wanted to say a few things, which we had tried to work out here in Kisi. Number one is to assist in the development of strategies to identify and manage common mental health problems. Uh, two, to work out reasons for the discomfort of health workers in dealing with mental health problems. A uh, problem with the health workers dealing with mental health problems, the kind of discomfort which we're trying to deal with. Then dealing with awareness of mental health, uh, tracking stigma. So, uh, and of course, harmful use of alcohol and violence in schools, especially in the university. So, uh, we don't, I, I don't have much to say today uh, because it's, I'm not in the panel for speaking. But also in attendance right now, we have uh, the head of nursing in Kisi University, Zila, and uh, also another nurse lecturer, Lynette Mangare. They're also in attendance. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much and a very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, we'll move on then. And we now have a presentation from Dr. Julius Agato from the Ministry of Health in Kenya. Please go ahead now. Thank you. OK. Um, uh, thank you so much for organizing this important conference on, on, on a very important topic, uh, that is mental health. Uh, I was to be accompanied by the director of mental health, but unfortunately he, he is not able to join because of a network problem where he is at the moment. Uh, but uh, I will give key highlights from the Ministry of Health perspective. Uh, I want to say that uh, mental health is a, a growing concern in the government of Kenya. We are having uh, an exponential increase in the number of uh, uh, mental health uh, patients or people who require mental health support and assistance. And as well, we are having an increase in the, uh, in the area of substance use disorders. Thirdly, we are having a, a quite a heavy demand or, or, and our system is not fully able to support the area of forensic psychiatry services and indeed the area of forensic medicine is not as developed as we would wish to have as a Ministry of Health in Kenya. Uh, we, we are looking in the Ministry of Health in upscaling access to uh, mental health services. Uh, one area where we really want to upscale is in the health workforce in terms of training, recruitment and the retention of the health workers. Uh, because medical training is very expensive and uh, we have quite a limited uh, number of uh, uh, mental health workers, we want to use an approach of, uh, of training uh, people through uh, the, uh, the middle level colleges, that is the Kenya Medical Training College, uh, in the area of a, a, post a post basic diploma in, uh, in psychiatry or mental health. Uh, also, we, we are upscaling the training of, uh, of mental health nurses and indeed we have started uh, a, a straight uh, the program of training uh, uh, nurses in uh, mental health uh, without doing the Kenya registered nursing and they come out as graduates in mental health nursing. 
this is on the realization that we've got uh, quite uh, a, a big gap. We, we are also having plans to introduce uh, a, a di diploma level training in uh, clinical uh, psychology. Uh, at the university level, we, we have tried, but the training positions are not enough. We, we, we currently have two universities offering a training in uh, uh, psychiatry at master's level, but we, we want to engage the other universities so that they can start uh, a master's training in uh, psychiatry. <clears throat> and also, we really would wish to start uh, specializing in, in um, specific areas in uh, psychiatry, like in uh, the, the, uh, child and adolescent psychiatry, uh, like in uh, the forensic psychiatry, where we have got uh, a, a big gap. Uh, in terms of upscaling uh, the access to care of our patients, we we are desirous of uh, investing much more in the level five hospitals uh, at the, to be regional uh, referral centers so that uh, uh, all the patients from the country don't get referred to uh, Madare National uh, Teaching and Re Referral Hospital. But we are having challenges of uh, of uh, financing this uh, infrastructure development. Uh, uh, and hopefully, in due course, we may need to seek ODA to support development of these regional referral centers. To be able to pick uh, mental health disorders much earlier, we need to upscale our community mental health services uh, through uh, 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 lower levels of care, that is at the community level uh, one and the level two and the three, and also upscale uh, the school health programs and bring in the aspect of, of mental health and the substance use uh, the disorders. Uh, as I have said, infrastructure we are quite constrained and. Uh, Hopefully, we, if we have support in form of ODA, it will really assist. Uh, and especially in the maximum security units where we hold people who are suspects of committing crime or have committed a crime uh, and need to be in a, a healthy institution, we currently have one which is not enough and uh, is quite contested. The population of Kenya has grown and we may need to have this at uh, regional levels. Uh, when we go to the prisons in mental health services, uh, our prisons have quite, quite a number of, uh, of uh, people with uh, mental health issues. Uh, and uh, we haven't uh, staffed them enough and we do not currently have enough facilities to take care of them. Uh, we hope once the physical space allows, we will be able to improve in this area. Uh, in terms of healthcare financing, we hope to increase budgetary allocation to mental health services. Unfortunately, due to competing interests, like in the current state of the COVID pandemic, this has not uh, been as we would have expected. And uh, there is uh, quite a need in increasing budgetary support towards uh, uh, mental health services, uh, but uh, the physical space is not allowing, and this is an area which calls for uh, overseas development assistance, if it is possible. Uh, it, it, when we come to substance use disorders, it is a growing problem, and uh, many families are, are affected, many schools are affected, uh, as uh, has been witnessed in uh, the newspapers uh, and even through the social media. So we, we are desirous of starting a, a, a training of tutors on how to pick uh, the uh, early signs of substance use disorder and how they are able to participate in preven uh, prevention of this uh, growing problem. 
and also we want to start ramping up the outreach services to support uh, the school health program. Uh, in uh, uh, community psychiatry, which is key, uh, but uh, we haven't invested enough as we would wish due to inadequate physical space, uh, we want to start uh, the training more people at uh, diploma level who could be able to work at uh, the community and at uh, level one, two and the three health faci facilities. And also from uh, the, uh, the improved uh, regional centers to give uh, outreach support in this area. Uh, we also uh, seeking strong partnership with other uh, state and non-state actors, uh, for example, the criminal justice system, to see that uh, we cap the issue of substance use disorders. Uh, research and development is key in uh, quality improvement and coming with inno innovative interventions uh, and our universities definitely will need uh, the support in this area in terms of faculty support and in terms of supporting uh, research and uh, development. And uh, this is an area whereby international co collaboration is key, especially uh, between uh, various uh, universities, both in the UK and in Kenya, to support this area of uh, in international collaboration. And uh, the Kenya-UK alliance becomes uh, quite uh, a vehicle for, for uh, improving this uh, collaboration. Uh, this brings me to uh, the end of my short presentation. Uh, thank you, Session Chair. Thank you very much for a very informative presentation. I'm going to go to Becky now to see if there are any questions in the chat or any comments for us to think about. Hello, uh, so Dr. Julius, so we have a question here saying thank you so much for the brilliant conversation so far. I am really interested to hear other Kenyan based colleagues or their work and what ideas resonate or not, or where their synergies might be for us linking together with them creatively or virtually. I look he, look forward to hearing more and being involved. So what ideas have resonated with you from the presentations this morning and how can we get involved more and work together more collaboratively? Thank you. Uh, re really, collaboration is key in, uh, for example, in uh, workforce exchange where uh, the, both the uh, Kenyan mental health workers can uh, the, come and work in the UK for a duration, either working or observership. And uh, in so doing, we get the technology transfer. And the other area of collaboration is supporting faculty in our training institution, either people from the UK coming as uh, to be members of faculty for a duration to support our team in the universities and the Kenya Medical Training College and as well uh, doing uh, b b b supporting our hospitals in mental health care like uh, another program which uh, b b was working very well and I hope it is working still well uh, the Pediatric Global Alliance, where we were getting support from the UK in uh, in pediatric care in various hospitals, and I participated in it uh, before, and it was quite successful. So if we can have uh, such that kind of collaboration, uh, our uh, uh, two peoples can uh, benefit. In the area of research, uh, it is equally important uh, that uh, we have uh, collaboration between our various universities in terms of joint research, in terms of clinical trials, and also working together with uh, our research institution, uh, Kenya Medical Research Institute, in the area of uh, uh, mental health. Uh, over to you, Chair. Thank you very much for that. I think we'll now move on to Dr. John Awiti for his presentation. And John is our Substance Misuse and Dual Diagnosis Lead within Oxleys. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, must have been introduced uh, by the Chair um, General, I'm John Awiti. Um, 
my my presentation is going to focus on uh, making a case for global um, engagement, global partnership, and how that uh, might benefit not only Oxley's uh, but also um, the NHS um, as a whole. And also, I will try to demonstrate that actually it is the the moral uh, thing to do. It is ethical and uh, the right thing to do at the moment. But also engaging global partnerships, actually, uh, there is a mutual benefit for both partners, both the NHS and uh, um, the overseas um, partner. Um, this time last year, the COVID-19 pandemic was emerging. Little did we know what its devastating impact would be. A year on, we know, and our hearts go out to all healthcare professional colleagues who have died in the time, in the line of duty in Kenya, in the UK, and all over the world. Um, my reflections on the pandemic, um, uh, and I think we have, we have actually learned a lot. For myself, uh, we have learned that the world is a global village, and infections and diseases actually are borderless. They spread, they are shared globally. And COVID-19 uh, pandemic has actually demonstrated that. There is also issues around differential outcomes, whereby there are similar infections which are shared globally, but then um, the outcomes are different based on ethnicity, based on localities, based on regions, and at times based on countries and even uh, within countries. And actually, it has also shown how global health inequalities uh, exist. There has been no differential um, response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, whereby some countries have done better uh, than others. This has been based on, on differential um, access uh, to expertise, resources, and actually even now with the roll rollout of vaccines, there is a differential uptake and availability as well in various um, parts of the world. One thing that, uh, that has also emerged is actually um, how the, the use of virtual platform for health delivery uh, has been very, very useful. And it is something that we would uh, take to the future. The risk benefit ratio for virtual platforms in health systems has actually shifted um, massively. Um, the NHS um, is increasingly engaging in global health. And currently, there is increased demand for NHS expertise, innovations, and services globally. And I think, as, as we had earlier in, in the previous presentation, so actually the Health Education England and with the Department of Health and Social Care it is actually encouraging uh, the formation of global health partnerships because it is clear that actually um, it can be um, a foundation for trans forming uh, the NHS into a global center of excellence uh, where we can actually train um, the workforce, but also we can develop and support healthcare systems both in the UK uh, and abroad. Um, the Department of International Development is additionally committed to supporting global health partnerships in areas of technical assistance, networking, advocacy, uh, but also the, there's understanding that the learning uh, from this engagement is actually bi-directional, whereby the NHS equally um, is equally learning uh, from the overseas uh, partnerships. Um, so the question is, why is global, why is global engagement um, and forming health partnerships important um, for the NHS? Um, the NHS has long benefited from global healthcare workforce. And the reality is that recruitment of workforce from overseas um, will not end um, in the near future. I think it will never end. I think that's what we have learned from the pandemic, actually, whereby in the last 10 months, we are actually told that the NHS has recruited over 8,000 overseas nurses to work in some of our hospitals. And this is another plan that actually they will recruit additional 1,000 nurses a month uh, in the year uh, to come. Um, Ruth May, the Chief Nurse Officer for England, in response to this 
high-end recruitment did say that the skills these specialist nurses are bringing to our hospitals are needed now more than ever. And it is a testament to our wonderful NHS that healthcare professionals from all over the world have chosen to come to work with us in a variety of roles, providing support and care to patients. Um, but then, in response to uh, to this recruitment, one of the the, the, the chairman of the uh, of the un of, of the of the, of the unions that are currently exist actually within the nursing workforce did say that this this is a global pandemic. We need to protect nurses in every country to deliver expert care to patients. Robbing Peter to pay Paul is ethically dubious. So I am wondering. How can the NHS behave ethically? How can the NHS make sure that robbing Peter to pay Paul can also be beneficial to Peter? And though it appears that global health workforce recruitment is, is like robbing Peter to pay Paul, one of the ethical ways of responding to this dilemma is through global health engagements and partnerships. This would actually ensure that Peter also benefits um, from this um, arrangement. And I am glad that actually I'm happy and proud that Oxley's has taken up an opportunity to develop mutually beneficial global health vision to share and exchange knowledge and experience through collaboration, mutual respect and shared vision with partners um, abroad. And global health workforce recruitment should be matched with global workforce development. It is more or less like reaping uh, from where actually you planted rather than uh, where you did not. Um, so what are the benefits of global health partnership? I think we have, our previous speakers uh, did um, talk about some of them. My, my colleague, um, Christine, and Francis were actually very clear on, on some of the benefits of global uh, partnership. Uh, Lord Crisp also um, did mention some. But I think for us, um, uh, for Mayor Sit with, with Oxley's, uh, we have various um, um, factors that we have actually looked into um, and, and actually thought that this is a good thing and we would be able to benefit from it. And one of them would be around professional and leadership development within the healthcare um, professions, um, not only within Oxley's, but also overseas as well. And actually, it has been demonstrated, actually, um, working um, overseas and engaging with partners, actually, is, is more or less a, a, a place for learning. And the staff that have come back from those engagements have actually demonstrated that there is increased staff confidence, improved team working, and actually also improved communication. But also learning um, um, was actually um, um, increased as well. And some of the people that came back were actually able to develop as potential uh, leaders uh, within um, the NHS. Um, secondly, uh, the area of development of research capacity. I think this has been also mentioned by my colleague in Nairobi, uh, who talked about um, a need in this area of development. But also for us uh, within Oxley's, we know that actually global engagement and partnerships would lead to development of expertise and experience in multidisciplinary multi research among staff, whereby we would have vibrant research and academic outputs. And that kind of research will lead to innovations in clinical practice, both locally and abroad, uh, development of better and cost-effective models of care, but also would lead to quality um, improvement. Fourth was around the issue of cultural competence. And I, being as, as an anthropologist, it is something that actually is, is actually um, um, close to my heart. Um, and we know that actually, um, as, an, as an ethnographer myself in the past, Actually, it is better to learn from and with the people than actually learning from afar. And actually, us engaging with the partners abroad will actually give us give us an opportunity uh, to learn. 
um, how other cultures work, but also how other organizations work. And that will also improve on our cultural competence and will be reflected on how we manage issues of cultural difference, um, unconscious bias uh, within our organizations. Secondly, it will also lead to appropriate and culturally sensitive interventions uh, where with patients from, from other cultures. And it has been shown, actually, there's a project I worked on in the past, whereby actually engaging with patients in a culturally sensitive way actually improves um, on the accuracy of the diagnosis um, and leading to better care planning, uh, contributes to better experience and engagement, but also will improve on treatment outcomes. Um, fourth is with engaging with global partners in enable us to strengthen the NHS and healthcare system. I know we have a robust healthcare system, but there's still always room for improvement. And I think some of this, um, 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 some of the learning that actually we can obtain from abroad might be able to be injected back into the NHS to improve our system so that it can be able uh, to work better. And one of the, the things that have come out from evaluations from partnerships abroad, it's actually uh, the staff that went abroad and came back did appreciate more the NHS resources. And this led to less wastage of resources in terms of uh, um, uh, providing care. Um, but also uh, they brought back innovation which they applied in their work, which leads to health systems threatening in the UK uh, but also they gained an understanding of how to innovate in delivering healthcare with limited um, resources, and that actually leads um, um, to cost um, savings. Fifth is resource sharing. And I think I previously um, uh, talked about international recruitment and uh, ethical issues um, around it, but then global Partnership actually gives us an opportunity and might well effective ways of dealing with the moral dilemma around global recruitment. We'll be giving back to Peter. And also we'll give officers an opportunity to share the expertise that we do have internationally. And I think our colleagues in Kenya mentioned issues around substance misuse, forensic psychiatry, uh, prison um, healthcare, and those are areas actually Oxley is, um, is actually known for, and we deliver services in those areas quite robustly at the moment. Actually sharing those expertise uh, with them uh, would be uh, a, a great um, idea. And we would also be supporting the workforce development among um, the partners. Um, Recruitment and retention. There have also been research evidence that actually when um, 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 staff are placed um, in overseas uh, through short-term placements, um, they do, um, staff on hearing that would actually want to engage with, with the NHS. Yeah, they would want to work for a trust that actually is out uh, what looking, that is able to enable them to be able to to travel overseas, um, contribute um, uh, to um, healthcare um, um, resources there, but also come back. And they, they found actually there is an increased staff commitment and productivity when actually um, such global partnerships uh, um, do exist. And there is a positive impact on staff retention, and that equals saving costs associated with high staff turnover. So when you recruit staff and there is a, uh, an organization that is actually out and looking, staff would actually stay. They would enjoy um, to work uh, for such an organization. And seventh is revenue generation. Um, this is global partnership of the potential to be an ethical sources of revenue. Actually, there are um, um, some partnerships which have been developed. And one of them is actually Modsley Health, um, developed by, through um, association uh, between SLAM and uh, United Arab Emirates. They actually 
they went in and established a model of care. And, and it, it could be a source of income, not only to make the partners to be self-sustainable, but also some of the money um, could be used for uh, reinvesting into the NHS um, services. Um, the last one is uh, enhance Oxley's profile. Oxley's will be part of the trend. And I think this is where uh, we are all going at the moment. We are all going global. And I think there are various trusts. Um, we have had conversations with them as well. Uh, the nearest one is East London NHS Foundation Trust, which has got uh, a link with the Butalika in Uganda. And they have done some amazing work. And we have talked to them and we have heard about their experiences and what they have gained uh, from uh, that uh, partnership. We have a King Self Partners, which is actually very broad. It's, it's actually uh, more or less all over the place. They are in Somaliland, they are in Congo Central Africa, they are in Zambia, they are in Sierra Leone, etc. And they are actually uh, doing amazing work as well. And uh, I mentioned about the mostly health partnership between SLAM and, and UEA, uh, whereby they actually established a world-class mental health and service misuse service within the UEA. And actually, it, it has become um, um, a, as a source for um, research-led learning experience. And I think we um, could also uh, do that in the future. There are also global health partnerships, which Cambridge Global Health Partnerships actually has got links in Africa, Asia, South America, India. And Manchester is also um, within them. And there are so many of them, actually, I couldn't um, just um, list all of them. Um, so for me, this journey is a very interesting journey. Uh, we have been talking about this um, uh, for the last um, uh, nearly um, um, six months, and COVID-19 pandemic has not dampened our spirits at all, and uh, we are uh, moving on uh, with it. And for me, it will be a robust and vi vibrant, if not ethical and moral, more moral response to global workforce recruitment. Not making sure that even though we take from PETA, but also we give back um, to PETA in terms of sharing our innovations, sharing our expertise, and also actively participating in workforce development and improvement on national leadership, both abroad um, and here uh, within Oxley's. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, John. That was absolutely excellent and has really shaped what we are trying to achieve. Uh, while you take your slides down, uh, we'll go to Becky to see if there are any comments or questions for you in the chat. Hi, John. Yes, there is. So Christine says that was really engaging. I love your points on the importance of cultural competence that could help us engage with our patients who have diverse backgrounds. So that was the comment that we also received. And then someone else has put, uh, thank you for the great and insightful presentations. Nursing research and innovation adoption is underachieved in some developing countries like Kenya. Are there specific steps that we can take to encourage nurses to be proactive and engage in research? Engage in research, sorry, looking at its relevance in adoption in practice. Um, I think one of the one, one of the things that uh, that actually we we could do, and this I'm talking from my own personal experience and from personal perspective, perspective as well, um, is actually one. I think this global um, partnership and uh, engagement, um, for instance, with Kenya, actually brings in an opportunity for us to actively uh, engage with the research and actively participate in research. And actually, and when that happens, actually the our own uh, staff at Oxley's would actually benefit from that because most of them would be involved in that process. Um, additionally, the, the Christian talked about um, advanced um, clinical practitioners. Actually, that Oxley's, I think, is, is actually looking at it and, and taking an active role in, in actually sending nurses with training. And one of the things, the skills that are in there uh, is actually to do with, with, with research, innovation and leadership. And I think nurses that take part in these trainings will be able to benefit 
uh, from that. And then we, we would be able to have an active, uh, at least an active culture within the trust. And I think coming from this, I think one, one of the things that uh, um, really did spur me on with is actually that we are aiming to actually establish a very active research culture within Oxidis. And I would encourage anybody that actually is interested in engaging uh, in this uh, research endeavor to, to shout. And we will be able to, we can, we will be going to have more or less like town hall meetings from today. We are meeting colleagues and engaging them, hearing their views. And actually, and if they really want to engage in this journey uh, of establishing a research active culture, quality improvement um, issues, we will be able to support that. And I think that's the strategy that I've gotten as well from, from, from the director of nursing as well. Actually, this is something we are going to engage with. Uh, fully, and we will be able to support colleagues to develop the research skills, but also engage in active research. Thank you. Thank you very much. That moves us nicely on to our next speaker, Dr. Miriam Wagaro. Uh, Miriam, are you able to share your slides and do your presentation? Definitely. If you would like to send them to me now, I'll put my uh, email address in the chat box. I'll be able to put them up for you. Thank you. In time, we have had another question asking for Christine's views, uh, Christine Kapopo's views on the research and innovation as they were interested in her presentation and they thought that linked very nicely with John's, uh, just while we are sorting that out. And so I'll say that our 2021 nursing strategy includes uh, research and innovation, mainly because we believe that nurses have a lot to offer and what they need is uh, uh, just a gentle nudge and encouragement and some structure to support them to innovate uh, in a structured way. Um, as I showed, uh, as I uh, shared earlier, we have a lot of nurses engaged in quality improvement, which is not research, but it's a step towards research. Um, as head of nursing in Bromley prior to uh, occupying this post here, we had started discussing how nurses can probably um, get together and write for publication. We know, most of our nurses are educated to degree level and have undertaken masters. So they have written some um, academic pieces of work. They've undertaken some academic pieces of work and they've written for uh, academic, academia. But um, they haven't really um, thought about uh, sharing their work with others. And they haven't really um, Taken further, taken their work further from a literature review to probably a more structured research. Uh, we have a keen interest from some heads of nursing. We have the infrastructure, we have the partnership with the University in Kenya, at, of, in Nairobi, and the University of Greenwich. And we have people there, well placed, who can support us to just take the, the things we already do, our innovation as it exists at the moment, help us remould it, reshape it, and um, uh, to start us on our path, for, uh, our research path. So yeah, that's something we'll be doing. It's already is it's already in our uh, nursing strategy, and this is one of the things we uh, hope to collaborate on with uh, Kenyan partners. So it will continue to be uh, part of our nursing strategy going forward. I hope that assures you that we are, um, you know, focusing on research, and we are making available resources to support it. Lovely. Thank you, Christine. We've had a nice comment here from one of our colleagues in Oxley's, just saying such great presentations today. Sorry she's been unable to join for longer, but she just wants to add all of her, uh, she just wants to reassure everybody her support to the global partnership and the research path. Thank you so much for your patience as well. I appreciate. Um, Kindly allow me to recognize my senior, Dr. Ogato, who is from the Ministry of Health headquarters, and also the rest of the senior panelists who are here and the organizers of this conference. It's a very important one coming at a time when uh, global partnerships are key to solving uh, issues on uh, global health uh, issues. So by a way of introduction, I uh, just want to say that international collaborations are critical to getting solutions 
that improve global health outcomes for populations. International collaboration can stimulate and facilitate action on health challenges through programming together, advocacy, and also technical support. Our partnerships today are increasingly seeking the mutuality of benefits in terms of resources that include flow of energies, expert knowledge, and knowledge transfer. So um, previously, developing countries were perceived as the sole beneficiaries of partnerships, but of late, uh, it's been um, demonstrated that developing countries are also generating effective solutions for global health when they partner with um, institutions in other countries. A quote by Lord Nigel Chris uh, from the literature, I saw that uh, he was former CEO of the UK National Health Service. I am not sure whether he's the person who has talked this morning as the co-chair Nursing Now campaign and the UK uh, all-party parliamentary group in global health. And um, his quote exemplifies what I've just said. And I want to quote what he said, that rich countries can learn a great deal about health and health services from poorer ones. Combining the learning from rich and poor countries can give us new insights on how to improve health and uh, future international collaborations. And this we have seen from the previous speakers who have testified how the um, collaboration with the developing countries have helped them gain some insight. So then um, I will then focus on the Oxilis Kenya Harambe Global Health Partnership that we've been working on with John and Moses for some time now and the director of nursing in Oxilis. We have used the word Harambe, and Harambe is a Kenyan tradition of community self-health events. It means that uh, all pull together, it is a Swahili word, it is a motto of Kenya. And in the context of this partnership, we envisage a situation where all of us partners will pull our resources together in different aspects to improve global health outcomes. Our resources can be in the area of human resource, it could be financial resource, it could be knowledge resource, and many others to improve global health outcomes. So we are looking at why the partnership with the UK institutions, and the UK institutions we have in mind is Oxley's Trust and Greenwich University, and the Kenyan institutions we have in mind are Madare Hospital, Kamili Organization, and the University of Nairobi School of Nursing. Um, indeed, there is a picture here that now I don't have the opportunity to present on the slide, so you may not be able to show. But it, uh, it, it's a figure that puts Kamili Organization, University of Nairobi, Oxalis, NHS, and Madari Hospital outside, and they are connected together in a strategic partnership. In this partnership, we see that um, we are together in resource transfer. And resource transfer here, uh, we are thinking that um, when we get our, co our, our partners from the UK working together with us as Kenyans, then there's a lot that we can learn. For example, um, John, when I talk with John, he lets me know that he is able to prescribe several drugs and he's able to manage uh, substance use disorders. In Kenya, the situation may be a bit different. We know that uh, nurses form over 50% of um, healthcare workforce and they provide up to 80% of healthcare services. And in this country, most of the, uh, of the mental health 
clinics are run mm. by nurses. And um, in the country, we may not be able to do a wide scope of practice the way it is done in the UK. So it would be necessary uh, when we have that resource kind of transfer, where we can learn from our colleagues how they manage to have this wide scope of practice. And with this wide, of, wide scope of practice, then the nurses can be able to reach so many patients and this can improve accessibility of a certain critical uh, mental health services to the Kenyan population. With the resources we have from our UK partners, we shall be able to develop targeted CPDs and um, for, for our nurses in Kenya. So we shall be able to build capacity of nurses at the place of work, which is very, very important because sometimes currently with the shortage of staff, it's uh, difficult or it is challenging to get staff being released for long periods to go and uh, sharpen their skills elsewhere. Uh, there will be training uh, and teaching and community-led uh, mental health uh, nursing services that I think we shall be able to benefit from. We can borrow from the models that uh, Camille is using and the UK uh, partners are using to also include users of mental health services within our partnership so that we have the voices of the users uh, represented. Uh, in the Kenyan situation, again, we have a situation where we have um, a mental health hospital that tries to integrate the general medical surgical services within it. We've not uh, been able to integrate a lot of uh, surgical services, but we've been able to integrate certain services like the dental services, like the, the other medical services, like the reproductive health services within our, men, uh, within our national mental health unit or, or hospital. In this uh, national mental health hospital, again, we have an aspect that deals with the patients uh, who are criminal offenders. And this is something that our UK partners can learn from, and we can come up with a model that can be very useful to our Kenyan population. Uh, so then, what is the outcome of this uh, improved health um, uh, our services to our populations and even our, our, our Kenyan population? And again, the other question that we're asking, what is the outcome of partnership to our various institutions? We, we can envisage that uh, there will be improved services and uh, with improved services, then we can have improved health outcomes for our populations. And this is because we'll be able to learn from strategies that work in the UK and we can be able to integrate with those that work in Kenya. And we believe that this will improve the quality of the services that we are going to give. There is also improvement uh, of um, global workforce. Uh, we know that um, before the COVID, the, nurse, the status report on nursing uh, had indicated that there was need to have about 6 million nurses by 2030 if UHS was to work. That situation has been made worse by the COVID pandemic where many nurses have also lost their lives and the capacity and the workload has improved. So we think that um, we shall need more nurses and this partnership can help us, one, to train more nurses, two, to create job opportunities for our nurses to go and work elsewhere and be able to contribute to mitigating the limited or the, or the acute shortage of nursing. Uh, it will also help us in um, developing and strengthening research. Um, because we know that when we collaborate together, 
then uh, the other nurses can be taught in Kenya, can be taught on uh, strengthening their research skills. Uh, most importantly is operational research so that nurses can uh, identify research questions that they can be able to answer and transfer the knowledge or the generated knowledge into practice so that the practice will be evidence-based. That is an area where we still have a gap. Uh, professional development will be important when we think of uh, the many specialties that the nurses outside there have in uh, mental health. We, we feel that uh, this collaboration will be helpful to help our nurses also develop professionally and gain some sub-specialities or sp super specialities like the area of uh, substance use, manage, um, use disorder management areas of uh, psychotherapy, areas of family, mental health, nursing. Uh, those are areas that we feel that um, can be developed further. We also believe that there will be a lot of mentorship so that our leaders can be, the nurse leaders in Kenya can be mentored. From lessons learned in the UK, uh, we can uh, develop a lot of leadership. We also feel that we shall be able to change experiences in models of care uh, like we have a very unique uh, model of care in our national mental health unit that the our colleagues from the uk can be able to benefit from we can also through this exchange of experiences our nurses going outside there can be able to have better experiences that they can transport back home and uh, there will be uh, uh, there, there will be um, gain on, on knowledge. Uh, visibility is another area that uh, we shall be able to work on. Uh, every organization um, re desires to be visible as a, a global health partner, to be known as contributing to the issues that affect the world populations. If we're able to do this together, co-writing co, co of grants, co-doing researches, uh, discussing issues and uh, solving uh, health population um, issues, then uh, this will help us to be on the map as um, institutions that are part of uh, the global uh, programs. And I think uh, that is where I won't stop my presentation, and um, I welcome any questions that might arise. Thank you so much, uh, the, the chair, for this session. Thank you so much. That is a great presentation, and it's really exciting to see how we can start our journey together. And it's really great to see it presented like this. I'm going to ask Becky to uh, take down the presentation and to uh, share any comments or questions that have come up on the chat, please, Becky. Hi, yes, thank you. So um, there is a comment from uh, Lynette. One of the reasons many nurses in low-income countries um, do not engage actively in research could be due to the lack of resources. Many are underpaid and engage in non-other nursing duties to make ends meet, since research in some countries, like Kenya, does not pay. Is there any support that Oxys can give to Kenyan nursing researchers? That's an <laughs> That is an excellent question and I think one of the underlying um, areas that we're trying to look at is how we can collaborate on research and actually use the resources within uh, different organisations and different countries to be able to mutually get the best out of this. Um, Miriam, have you got any thoughts on this? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, okay. When we have these partnerships and we, we identify in the clinical areas research questions that we need to answer, uh, it is my belief that we can have um, a co-grant writing activity. And I think in this then we can all look for funds together 
from different countries to be able to answer such research questions. That's what I think. Uh, I think that is the way Oxalis would be able to, to, to help. I don't think that Oxalis will just give us money to do research if they are not involved. <laughs> yes. Because there are many things we can do together. We can even do some like a comparative study and that requires that we have some funds. Again, my experience with the current funding uh, organizations is that the more collaborative and multidisciplinary the team is, the more likelihood that they are going to get those research funds. Again, we may not get research funds from Oxalis directly, but when we all work together and do a, a project, then we can look for funds together, the NIH and others. That's how I can answer that. Brilliant, thank you. Becky, are there any other comments or questions? Yes, uh, so from Christine, we have just said uh, that I like that you've stated about hearing the service user's voice, which is really important when undertaking any kind of research or improvement work. And Francis has said about how pleased he is to have all these universities on board, which means that we'll be able to investigate how we do things. And this is an opportunity to learn and seek support from each other, especially in getting grants. Uh, thank you. I think that was a statement. Uh, there is always room for improvement. We can all work together. Yes. Thank you very much, Miriam. We're really looking forward to working closely with you. I'm going to mm -hmm. now move us on to our closing speech. Um, we're really, really um, privileged to have His Excellency Manoa Esipisu, who is from the Kenyan High Commission to the United Kingdom. And I'd, I'd like to invite uh, you to um, share your slides or, or do your presentation if you're ready now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon. Since I'm closing, I, I don't think I should have any slides. You have had and seen sufficient from uh, people with the relevant expertise. Uh, I would like to thank Oxley for putting uh, this together and my Kenyan colleagues for, for participating. Uh, uh, it's, it was very good to hear from, from, from Kristen uh, there. Uh, I wondered whether you came from Zambia, by the way, uh, initially, at least. No, uh, not initially. I am Zambian, yes. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> and I've been to okay. Nairobi many times. Yeah, okay. Um, the Ke Kenya and the UK uh, are partners, strong partners, strategic partners, over a long period of time. And just last year, Prime Minister Johnson and President Kenyatta signed this agreement that made us uh, strategic partners. Uh, in January, uh, Secretary of State Dominic Crab signed uh, the Kenya Health uh, uh, MOU with our Health Cabinet Secretary, uh, Mutahi Kagwe. And we are therefore very keen to do everything that we can to ensure that the partnership isn't a partnership on paper, but that it is one in which we can see tangible results uh, for both the United Kingdom uh, and for Kenya. And our interest is also, is really your interest, I, I think at this point, uh, we are focusing on the things that you are focusing on. We're focusing on innovation. We're focusing on capacity. We're focusing on research. Uh, we're focusing on strengthening our healthcare systems. And to the extent that we can make uh, these things work for uh, both Kenya and the United Kingdom, I think Kenya will feel that we are making progress. Uh, are in the way that the UK will feel. And I, th I know that uh, uh, Julius was talking a lot about uh, how you can rob Peter 
and not and, and still serve Peter. Uh, uh, but it's really a question of seeing what are the areas of need for for the UK, what are areas of need for Kenya, and ensuring that we can do things on both sides to and to get our areas of need met. Where where is your area of deficit? Uh, where is our area of deficit? What are the opportunities for collaboration, uh, such like that? I know uh, Dr. Miriam was talking just now about uh, about, about how we can collaborate in the area of research. Uh, it's a question that you you had you uh, chair you had asked in the first instance, uh, and it's it's clear that you have systems here that have these funds for research. And it is really a question of our ourselves and yourselves looking at what are the questions that need to be asked that can be supported by your institutions uh, in order that we have joint programs that deliver the result that we need to deliver. Uh, so these, these are gaps, but they are gaps that have a way to plug. Uh, and I think if we, uh, if we really grasp the opportunity before us, uh, we should be able to come out of this stronger. We should be able to come out of this with a partnership uh, that 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 really works. And uh, we, we we keep saying in Kenya, which is true, we have a huge surplus of of general nurses, uh, whereas you have a, a huge shortage actually of general nurses, uh, whereas we need some expertise. Uh, uh, which you can provide, and we can provide you with, uh, with so, so, so to speak, uh, raw education and talent, uh, and, and people who can get the job done. So there is an opportunity in the coming weeks and months uh, to cement this and to get our partnership really, um, really oiled uh, so that the car is moving in the right direction. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you organizing this this event, and I really appreciate your contributions, uh, which will go a long way in cementing this strong relationship beca between Kenya and the United Kingdom. Thank you, and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We're very grateful that you joined us. I, I'm going to go back to Becky now to see if there are any further comments or questions on the chat, or if there have been any priorities suggested in terms of the program to start with for us to consider. And then after that, I'm just going to open up for a general discussion for anybody who's present uh, on the panel who wants to ask questions or reflect on what we've heard this morning. So Becky, over to you first of all. So hi everyone. So there's just been a few things that have come through through this morning. People seem to be really excited, really ready to engage with the partnership. There's been some talk about whether or not we could look at um, exchange programs again for nursing students to see if that could be something that could benefit. Um, Obviously, people bringing up about they like the idea of research, but looking into the ethics and that behind that and that, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But people seem very proactive in wanting to get involved in that, which I think is really, really good. Um, Jane, someone would just like confirmation as to how they can access this at a later date because they missed some this morning due to something else they had to do. So just if we could let people know how to access it afterwards. Um, and... There is also uh, someone from Oxys just saying, what a great way to be working on our quality improvement programs that we have on in Oxys and how we can share that learning. So there's lots of um, lots of comments coming in just about how willing people are this partnership to be really successful and how we can we can do that. Thank you, Becky. I will circulate a link so that people who weren't able to access all of the conference this morning can access it at a later date and also share it with colleagues who, who may have missed the opportunity. We've had a real richness of speakers and a real commitment to our cause that we really want to do this together. So I'd really like to encourage that engagement and that sharing as much as possible. 
So before we end, um, I'm, I'm going to bring in John Awitty, um, Moses Mullimira and others who are present with us on the panel just to see if you have any reflections or questions of each other that we'd like to uh, address before we close. Uh, maybe, John, I could start with you. <clears throat> Thank you. And good afternoon, Your, your Excellency. Um, Thank you for joining us um, uh, for today to, to close the, the, the conference. I think one of the reflections that I have is actually resonates with, the, with our original uh, discussions with the University of Nairobi. It's actually what our priorities might be actually moving forward. And, uh, and I think it is interesting that the public vote actually did pick on, on, on research, uh, which is related to QI. Uh, ideas called improvement endeavors, or uh, clinical leadership, and then in terms of clinical areas, there was um, a mention of substance misuse. I said one of the areas that you might be able to uh, to collaborate on, actually use as a, as a stepping stone. And actually, but it, it is actually very interesting. That these are some of the things that we did talk about in our preliminary discussions um, uh, with Nairobi. And I think it is interesting the public actually with us uh, in terms of uh, setting the agenda on how actually uh, we move um, uh, with this um, forward. And I can only feel uh, energized, uh, but also that what we have been thinking about actually been vindicated uh, by the public or the Oxley's uh, staff and the conference attendees, but actually in tandem uh, with what our thoughts um, and actually and, 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 and plans are, I think another issue that came up was about research and how actually we can move this forward. And this depends much actually us working as partners um, among um, the University of Nairobi, University of Greenwich, uh, and Oxley's NHS Foundation Trust. And actually having more or less um, joint discussions, uh, joint formulations of research ideas, and joint applications for research funds. Actually, it depends on all of us, actually, not only Kenya, not only here, but I think all of us putting our energies together and, and, and actually working through this. I think the most important thing about this partnership is actually that it, it, is, it is actually mutual. No partner is, is actually a, a bigger than the other or having more resources than the other. Actually, we are coming together and we are starting from, from the basic level in terms of the energy but also in terms of our knowledge and also in terms of how we move uh, this forward. Um, thank you, Jen. Thank you. Moses, have you got any reflections or comments? Um, I think I'm just appreciative for everyone who's been here and the richness in terms of discussions. Maybe I should ask my colleague John, another John here whom I work with, just to offer some input because he's been very key behind the scenes as well to support the other side. John. I'm really excited to see the priorities, especially from the Minister of Health, in where they are looking to partner to improve uh, patient outcomes in a, in a way which uh, we impact care, which is really a big um, aim for affecting humanity. And if we can do something small to have a change in someone's life, I think from the public view, our social responsibility has been achieved. But as well as uh, moving with the times which we live, where evidence is key, I'm keen to look uh, how research can drive change uh, where evidence is key in making any change in uh, a way which uh, Kenya and the UK can mutually benefit. But finally, what I've seen here, which has come out very clearly as well, is um, the new responsibility and duty for nurses in terms of uh, influencing the care in future. One of the other things which has seen rising here is how do we utilize the number of uh, human resource which is within uh, Kenya, for example, which our High Commissioner has highlighted that the UK needs. Uh, so 
if we can harmonize these uh, mutual benefits for all of us, I think we will create a better future and we are all one village. Uh, so I'm really uh, thankful for all of you and also for the government of Kenya for creating this platform where we can have uh, this partnership working for all of us. That was very well put. Thank you very much. I'm just going to invite other panel members to see if they'd like to make any closing comments. Uh, Francis, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I could add something. I, I guess maybe what I <clears throat> just need to say and confirm is the formalization of the relationship uh, that I think we are just achieving and extremely pleased and impressed about uh, the caliber of people who've joined and who, those who've presented, uh, especially having His Excellency join us and senior colleagues from uh, Oxley's and uh, from Kenya and the overall health system. I think the approach that we've taken in looking at research, it's, 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 it's a wonderful one because with research we can start understanding what is going on in each other's areas and how we can support each other. There is also a wide, wide range of things that we could do and large uh, uh, staff that are available to do it. I believe when this goes out about the collaboration, it, it would straight away give an indication that Oxley is looking forward, Kenya is looking forward, and how we would use this to support our staff um, locally. I think that, 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 well, I'm so impressed, I'm so pleased, and I'm just waiting for Peter and Paul to be sitting <laughs> around the table and see how we share ideas. And no, there is no way that this is going to be a win-win. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. I think that's brought us to a really natural conclusion for one of the most fantastic conferences I've had the pleasure of being part of for a very long time. I feel Maybe that there is... Sorry. A... That's OK. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, this is Raymond from Kissy, Dr. Raymond. Hello, hello. Please go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't have a, a real presentation, although we were supposed to have the panel there, but we are, we are extremely grateful for what we have seen, the high-level discussions on on the mental health nursing and and uh, the collaboration between Kenya and, uh, and the UK. We are really looking forward to having uh, this program also extended to Kisi University. Kisi, Kisi uh, Teaching and Referral Hospital has got a big mental unit uh, with a lot of need uh, for our nursing and uh, medical staff, so we and uh, we really look forward to even starting a program in the university here in collaboration. Uh, thank you very much. This was really quite enlightening. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I think uh, we're all really looking forward to this partnership and the next steps. So on that note, I'm going to thank each and every one of the contributors and each and every one of the people who have helped organise this so well and helped make sure that it broadcasts so smoothly. And I'm going to uh, wish everybody a, a very a peaceful and relaxing afternoon. I think uh, you've all earned it. And I really look forward to taking us on the journey together with our colleagues from Kenya. And finally, thank you to His Excellency for joining us. It's uh, been really, really appreciated. So thank you, everybody. God bless. Bye bye.